Hello, and a very warm welcome to the Brain Prize meeting, Neurodevelopmental Disorders, Mechanisms and Pathways to Treatment. My name is Martin Meyer, and I'm the director of the Brain Prize. And the Brain Prize was first awarded in 2011 and is today the largest personal award that's dedicated to neuroscience. And the award is given each year by the Lundbeck Foundation to one or more neuroscientists who've made outstanding contributions to their field and who are still active in research. And the Brain Prize recognises advances in any field of neuroscience, from basic to clinical, and winners may be of any nationality working in any country in the world. And the Lundbeck Foundation itself was established in 1954 by a visionary businesswoman, uh, Greta Lundbeck. And now the Lundbeck Foundation is one of the largest commercial foundations in Denmark. And we use the financial returns from our investments and our ownerships of healthcare and biotech companies to fund academic research in Danish universities. And we have a very strong focus on the brain. Indeed, we are the largest private funder of academic neuroscience within Denmark. And we use the Brain Prize to reward and promote excellence in neuroscience, but also to raise public awareness of the brain and of its disorders. And following the award of the Brain Prize each year, we have one of these meetings, the Brain Prize meetings. And these meetings aims to bring together researchers to discuss progress and challenges in the field of the current year's winners. And in 2020, the Brain Prize was awarded to Huda Zogby and Adrian Bird for their pioneering work on Rett syndrome. This is a devastating neurodevelopmental disorder that primarily affects girls in their early childhood. And Huda and Adrian's work demonstrated the role of MECP2 in Rett syndrome, but also of epigenetic regulation in brain development but also maintenance of normal function in the adult brain. Crucially, their work has also challenged the notion that neurodevelopmental disorders are irreversible. And in this year's Brain Prize meeting, uh, which is a virtual meeting, we will have four topics or four sessions over four days, one session per day, and we will cover topics such as epigenetics and regulation of gene expression, genomics and identification of mutations that are relevant to neurodevelopmental disorders, neuronal and circuit dysfunction, as well as diagnosis and treatment of neurodevelopmental disorders. You will hear talks from both Huda and Adrian, and towards the end of the meeting, we will have an open discussion with both prize winners about their science and their scientific journey. And to close the meeting, we will be announcing the winners of the Brain Prize for 2021. With that said, I'd like to hand you over to the chair of our first session, Professor Carmen Sandy, who's at the Brain Mind Institute at EPFL in Switzerland. Um, welcome to the meeting, Carmen. Uh, now it's over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Martin. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, in this uh, um, uh, opening, this uh, first uh, session of the um, Brain Prize uh, meeting. And uh, this session is going to deal uh, on the epigenetics and regulation of gene expression in neurodevelopmental disorders. And I'm really looking forward very much uh, to hear what uh, the different speakers have to say, because I think uh, they are going to really tackle some of the most fundamental uh, topics uh, and aspects uh, in, the, in this field, which is, I think, uh, critical to understand disease, uh, particularly related to neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, so um, today for this uh, first session, uh, we have uh, uh, an amazing lineup of speakers. Uh, as Martin indicated, we have uh, uh, the, the presentation of the first uh, of the two uh, prize winners uh, from 2020, Adrian Bert. And uh, afterwards, uh, he will be followed by Elisabeth Winder, who is uh, uh, from the Max Planck Institute in Munich. And finally, we will have uh, Jonathan Mill, 
uh, from Exeter University. Something that is important is that uh, after each of these talks, uh, we are going to have uh, between five and ten minutes of questions, which is with, with each of the speakers' question and answer, answers uh, session. And uh, I really would like to encourage you to send questions already during their talks. Also during the question and answers uh, session, you can send the questions, and uh, you can do that uh, by. Uh, including your question in the chat window that you have on the right side, I think, of your screen. And for everyone else uh, that wants to be involved, I think it will be very interesting if uh, you vote those questions that you consider particularly important, because uh, I will be asking the questions that get the highest number of votes. So I think uh, we need everyone uh, participating here so that we have the most interesting uh, discussion with the speakers. Um, so, uh, in addition to these two keynote, uh, three keynote speakers, uh, and after the first uh, two, we are going to have uh, three uh, very exciting uh, flash talks uh, that uh, have been selected from some of the uh, presentations uh, from the attendees. Uh, and I think uh, they are also going to be very interesting. It promises to be a quite a complementary type of presentations on the topic. Each of them is going to be five minutes, and afterwards we will have the opportunity also to have a short discussion with the three uh, Flash Talks uh, speakers. So please include also or send also your questions for these uh, uh, Flash Talks or more junior speakers. And then at the end, uh, we will have a panel discussion with the six uh, speakers. And here we are going to try to tackle more general questions. Uh, in particular, the topic for this uh, panel discussion is uh, where do we want to be in this topic, in the field of epigenetics and regulation of gene expression in neurodevelopmental disorders in 10 years' time from now? And also, how do we get there? Do we Can we already uh, maybe foresee what are the main uh, directions that we need to take and also the challenges and uh, the, the technical uh, uh, solutions that uh, need to be implemented in, in order to make uh, this type of uh, co uh, contribution. So I think yeah, we have uh, ahead around three hours of uh, wonderful science, uh, also I think uh, intriguing discussions. And uh, now without further ado, I think uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Adrian Bird from the Welcome Center for Cell Biology at the University of Edinburgh and the 2020 Brain Prize winner to talk about the epigenetics, the genetics and epigenetics of uh, Red Syndrome. Adrian, the floor, the screen is yours. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm assuming you can see uh, my slides. I can see them, so I presume you can see them as well. <clears throat> it's a tremendous honor to be uh, given this award. Uh, by the Lundbeck Foundation, um, uh, with Huda Zogby, of course, who we'll hear from on Thursday. Uh, not to mention, for me anyway, a, a big surprise. Um, uh, and I think it's a credit to the work of the people <clears throat> in my team over a long period of time when we've sort of tenaciously gnawed at this problem. Um, and what I'm going to do today is to summarize where I think we've got to. Um, in our understanding of the molecular basis of Rett syndrome, and that includes the genetics and <clears throat> what is loosely known as the epigenetics of, of Rett syndrome. So I'm now going to try this clicker, and it, it does click, and uh, it didn't click, but it made it change the slide. Um, so first of all, at a very um, uh, high level, DNA methylation is an epigenetic mark, so-called added to certain cytosine bases in DNA. It's added after the DNA is replicated, and it's represented by these um, little uh, red and uh, yellow <coughs> um, molecules, um, moieties, sitting in the, in the major groove of DNA. Uh, uh, it doesn't alter the genetic code, uh, so it's a sort of a, it's a, it's a message added to the DNA that does not affect its ability to curve a protein. And most of it is in uh, the dinucleotide sequence CG, but not, as we will uh, see later, all of it. <clears throat> so um, our adventure with um, this protein, MECP2, began uh, when we discovered it, when my lab was in, in, um, in Vienna, 
um, by uh, asking if there were proteins in the genome that could recognize methylated DNA. So in other words, this was Blue Skies research, not aimed at um, anything uh, applied, but just trying to understand how DNA methylation might be read uh, as a signal and what the consequences of that would be. So uh, what you can see on the left is, is a blob uh, labeled MECP2. When we probed our uh, transferred gel of nuclear proteins to with methylated DNA, and if we took the same DNA sequence and probed it with unmethylated DNA, we saw the histones at the bottom, but we did not see anything implying that this was specific for methylation, um, methylated DNA. And on the um, uh, here is a, a much later uh, structure in collaboration with Malcolm Walkinshaw's group, uh, where we can see in molecular detail the, how that works. The, the two methyl groups are sitting in the major groove again. I don't believe I can point. Uh, presumably you can't see the cursor there. Can you see the cursor? No, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> sitting in the major groove and we know now exactly why those methyl groups specify the binding. So um, the, the, our interest uh, became uh, somewhat enhanced and somewhat different when uh, Huda Zogby's lab showed that MECP2 was mutated in Rett syndrome. Um, and what's since, emer since emerged that, that uh, as well as being mutated in uh, the disorder Rett syndrome, it's also uh, mutated um, in, in ex uh, intellectual disability. These are hypomorphic or weaker mutations. And as I believe Huda will talk about and, and knows more about than me anyway, uh, is MECP2 duplication syndrome, uh, where most often boys have two copies of the gene. So what this tells us is that too little is, is, is bad and too much is also bad. And uh, that's an interesting feature of MECP2 that's really um, yet to be fully uh, explained, I would say. So. Um, some, some background on MECP2. Um, the uh, uh, individuals with Rett syndrome have uh, received a mutant copy of the MECP2 gene. Uh, they're nearly always females, uh, and uh, we'll just consider the female case here because it's the vast majority. Uh, they receive a, muta a mutated MECP2 uh, um, and consequently are heterozygous. Uh, males who have just one X chromosome, and if it's got this mutation, uh, rarely uh, survive infancy uh, and are severely affected um, from, from early on. So um, uh, the significance of X linkage is that X inactivation takes place soon after fertilization, and consequently cells have a choice as to whether or not they inactivate the mutant X chromosome uh, or the wild type X chromosome. And depending on which choice they make, you end up with either a cell which is MECP2 plus functionally uh, or MECP2 minus functionally because it only is expressing the mutant form. And this gives rise to mosaicism. And this is visualized um, uh, here in, in a piece of the dentate gyrus of, of a mouse showing the... Um, um, uh, interspersion of MECP2 positive and MECP2 negative cells due to a, a differential staining of the two uh, of the two proteins from from one or the other allele. So the the presence of the wild functionally wild type cells rescues the individuals, but at the price of uh, Rett syndrome. So early on, we made a mouse model. Um, the Anish lab made a mouse model at the same time um, and showed the same thing, namely that uh, if you look at males, uh, then uh, the absence of functional MECP2 means that they do not survive uh, for very long. They survive, they, they start off looking normal, but then they acquire severe phen uh, neurological phenotypes and they die usually about 12 weeks. Uh, whereas uh, females initially are, have no phenotype whatsoever, and one can breed from them during this time, but subsequently they acquire a phenotype, they sort of almost hit a wall after several months, and from then on, they have a chronic neurological phenotype. And uh, without going into the details, that the nature of those phenotypes suggests that actually what MECP2 is, and everything subsequently suggests that what MECP2 does in, hu in mice and, and in humans is more or less the same thing. Um, 
So I, I haven't given you a justification for that statement, but uh, the mouse model is an excellent model of Rett syndrome. And uh, mechanistically, we've not found anything that's really majorly different between uh, humans and mice uh, with respect to its function. So MECP2 is highly abundant and essential in the brain. So the evidence for that, uh, first of all, I'll show you that a few days after birth, and this is a mouse, this is in mouse, um, but the same thing happens in humans. It accumulates um, and quite significantly in a few uh, days and weeks after birth. Um, and if you look at where it is, it's predominantly in the brain. Um, the tall bars there represent uh, the amount of protein uh, in various brain regions, forebrain, midhind brain. Uh, cerebellum is lower, uh, spinal cord is higher, uh, but then other tissues in the body do not seem to have much MECP2 at all, nowhere near what is found in the brain. Um, so when we counted how many molecules there were, we were quite astonished to find that there are something like 17 million molecules on average in neurons uh, per cell. Uh, and that is uh, thousands of times more abundant than, say, a transcription factor. And it approaches the number of nucleosomes that there are in the nucleus. So it looked as though, and uh, the results of chip seek, etc., have supported this, that there's enough of this protein to spread all over the genome. And of course, DNA methylation is a genome-wide mark. And finally, uh, I'll just uh, show this result, which uh, um, Paul Ross and, and Jackie Guy um, uh, published a few years ago. And this is to show that if you take, um, if you look at the third mouse along, it has got uh, MECP2 in its um, periphery, or as a neuroscientist tend to call most of the body, uh, but not in its um, brain and spinal cord. And that animal is severely affected by Rett syndrome-like symptoms. If, on the other hand, you look at a, an animal which has uh, MECP2 in its brain and spinal cord, the fourth one on the right, um, then, uh, but not elsewhere in the body, this animal is effectively wild type. So what this tells you is that the most important functions of MECP2 are in the brain. And while there were some weak phenotypes in the, uh, of uh, peripheral knockout, um, the, uh, the, the, they were, didn't include any of the major phenotypes associated that, that mirror Rett syndrome in humans. So this disorder is primarily, its seat is in the, is in the, the nervous system. Oh, sorry, pressing the wrong button there. So um, uh, if you uh, inactivate MECP2 gene in adult mice, uh, that leads to death. And the Zogby lab showed this, our lab has shown it, uh, and um, uh, uh, it's been shown by others too. Um, so in other words, you need MECP2 the whole time. On the other hand, if you grow up without it, as these mice uh, shown at the bottom have, um, then um, the phenotype which you see uh, the mouse on the bottom left is supposed to be moving now, but is not. Um, but it's got, anyway, it's got the Rett syndrome uh, phenotype. I don't know if there's any way of, um, no. Okay, I can't make that movie work, um, which is a shame. Um, oh, I thought I saw it move there for a second. No. OK, so the phenotype of the mice is that they don't move very much. They have breathing arrhythmia and that mouse on the left would be uh, would die uh, within uh, a couple of weeks, uh, whereas uh, the mouse on the, on the right, it's actually the same mice as mouse in which we've reactivated MECP2 and it's now um, uh, healthy again. Uh, and I'm sorry, I can't uh, show you that uh, film. So, uh, so what is MECP2 actually for? And that's not a very acceptable way of asking the question, but uh, let me just, um, uh, we are led uh, to a great extent by where the mutations are. This is a somewhat outdated uh, picture here, but what you can see is that the, 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 the mutations that cause Rett syndrome are clustered over the red MBD, which is the methyl CPG binding domain, and the green uh, NID, which is the NCOR interaction domain. And I'm just gonna say a few words about both of those. Um, the, um, on the other hand, uh, mutations with uh, polymorphisms with no clinical effect are 
um, avoid those two regions um, and are clustered elsewhere. So uh, MECP2, it turns out that if we first of all consider the DNA binding domain, the red domain on the last slide, um, it, it, uh, it, it binds to two sequences, not one. We originally thought it was just one. We called it the methyl CPG binding domain. But um, uh, the Song lab and uh, the Greenberg lab uh, uh, and, and our lab has also been involved in showing that it also binds to the major, uh, to a major non-CG methylated sequence that's found in, in brain. Uh, and that's CA, methyl CAC. So um, uh, if you incubate a double-stranded DNA in vitro, you get a very specific binding. Um, it's a pity I can't point here. Uh, are there tools? No. Okay. Um, so on, on, in the left panel, you see the, the, the bound. It's binding to methyl CG. It's binding to methyl CAC, but the unmethylated forms of those two, it doesn't bind to at all. And a sequence that was thought to bind from early work, GTGT, John Connolly showed, does not bind, in fact, in vitro or in vivo. So everything that we have done says that MECP2 is specific for 5-methylcytosine-containing DNA. Um, Coincidentally, MECP2 um, increases after birth. I've already shown you that, the blue line on this graph. But the red line also shows that methyl CA, or methyl CA most abundantly, CAC most abundantly, also increases after birth. Uh, and this um, coincides with the time, actually, suggestively, when the symptoms of, uh, of uh, RET-like symptoms arise in the mice. So, Non-CG methylation is very abundant in neurons, not elsewhere. Uh, nearly as much methyl CAC as methyl CG, and this is uh, uh, really from Lister et al. study. Joe Ecker uh, and Hume Stroud has also done these experiments in the Greenberg lab. Um, it's very abundant, uh, and it increases at the same time as MECP2. So let me uh, show that the same thing is true in vivo. Uh, we have uh, uh, Justina Colliver Vachlor developed this way of uh, footprinting, and these show a taxic footprints of MECP2 bound to methyl CG followed by any of the four bases. Uh, and then this shows um, it bound to me methyl CG. Um, uh, oh dear. Sorry. The clicker is it? Yeah. Um, this shows that it, if you have methyl CA followed by C, you get a very strong footprint, uh, whereas if it's followed by T, you get a very weak footprint and you don't get a footprint at all if it's followed by A or G. So in other words, the binding specificity that we see in vitro of this dual binding specificity for methyl CG and methyl CAC is also seen in vivo. And we recently, um, Becky Tillotson and Justina Kolovakla substituted the um, DNA binding domain of MECP2 by a DNA binding domain for another methyl binding protein that can't bind methyl CAC. It still binds methyl CG, and uh, uh, this just shows that. The footprints show on the left MECP2 in green, on the right this protein which we christen MM2, it can't bind methyl CAC anymore. And uh, without going through all the details that have recently been published, not being able to bind methyl CG but, n but not being able to buy methyl CAC is bad. Um, survival is shown declining in the orange curve on the right, uh, whereas um, compared to the controls that obviously live normally through that period. And if you uh, look at the range of survival curves for different mutations that cause Rett syndrome, the orange line is more or less in the middle. So it's a typical Rett syndrome severity uh, caused by the inability to bind one of the two binding sites, namely methyl CAC. So we conclude from that that methyl CAC is absolutely essential for the function of the brain. So then the NCORE interaction domain, the other little cluster of mutations, is shown with this yellow box. And this, um, as Matt List showed, is cause, uh, is interacts with a co-repressor, which represents represented by that term airship looking structure on the left, which normally is known for binding to unliganded nuclear receptors. It actually binds to MECP2, and the interaction occurs with not the main NCORE uh, 
scaffold, but with TBL, these little yellow proteins on the left. And um, the structure of that we know a little bit about. It's a heterotetramer or, or a tetramer of TBL proteins, which have these WD40 uh, sort of pom-poms on the uh, uh, shown in, in that image. And uh, we, in collaboration with that Atlanta Cook's lab, we solved the structure of that interaction. And uh, the reason why I'm showing it to you is that those, that little cluster of mutations is really four sites. And those four sites are uh, a P, K, K, R, as shown in red on the right in the bottom. Uh, and all of those amino acids make contact with the center of the WD40 domain. And so that really argues that this interaction is the key interaction whose loss causes Rett syndrome. Rett syndrome. Um, so this uh, says that um, if you can't bind DNA, you get Rett syndrome because many of the mutations abolish the binding to DNA and the red domain there. And if you can't bind NCOR, you get Rett syndrome, and that, that, that's the blue cluster of mutations there. And so the obvious model is that MECP2 recruits um, the red drum here is recruiting the green NCOR co-repressor to the methylated sites on the DNA. And the mutations that break either end of that bridge, if you, uh, as you might call it, uh, cause, uh, lead to the dis di disorder. So just to show you the recruitment in action, if you look, and here it would be quite useful to point, but um, t at the bottom is TBL in red, and it doesn't have a nuclear localization signal. So third from the right on the bottom, it's in the cytoplasm. But if you add MECP2 to those cells, then you see a third from the right on the top row, which is that being TBL being dragged to the heterochromatin, which is where most of the DNA methylation is. And so that's where MECP2 accumulates. So I'm not going to go into that anymore. There's a control on there showing that you can't do that if you've got a mutation in the uh, NCOR interaction domain. So I've argued for this recruitment model, but there are actually other models out there in the literature, chromatin compaction, uh, an activator model where MECP2 activates transcription, alternative splicing regulation, microRNA processing. Uh, I don't think any of these models is as well supported by data as the co-repressor uh, model. I just wanted to show, oh, there's also the multifunctional hub model, which I say is the most popular, um, which in, uh, says that MECP2 is lots of things. One of them is maybe repression, uh, but there are others too. So um, I just want to give a brief update on that. We, uh, we um, Kashap Chatbar in the lab had a look at, uh, used a multivariate quantitative analysis to analyze data sets to look at the alternative splicing model, and he was unable to see any effect of um, MECP2 on alternative splicing and didn't he, uh, this is global alternative splicing and the same for DNA methylation in fact and then another uh, recent addition is the uh, a, a, a couple of papers that have pointed to um, the following phenomenon namely, namely that MECP2 accumulates in these uh, globs and you will if you've been uh, awake during the last uh, few uh, last year, you will have uh, not been able to, a couple of years, you will not have been able to avoid condensates, liquid-liquid phase transition, etc. And that was invoked as a, uh, a functional um, aspect of MECP2. And I'll just say very, very briefly that um, it's important to bear in mind that the mouse has these uh, foci of MECP2, but human, rat, monkey, in fact, any other uh, mammal that, uh, or, or vertebrate that I know of does not. So this is a mouse-specific phenomenon, and we understand why. It's because in mice, there's a satellite that's very rich in methylation, which is what MECP2 likes to bind to. So I think if you're going to invoke the coalescence into globs or uh, condensates, you need to bear in mind that they're not detectable, at least as such, in other organisms. So um, the MBD and the NID are sufficient for uh, uh, MECP2 function. If, if they're the important bits, you would expect that they would be sufficient. And so um, uh, this, uh, that, that would mean that despite the conservation, which you can see in the pink underneath the, the bar, which is uh, quite high in, in mouse, for example, 95% of amino acids are identical, same in the rat, um, then you would expect that uh, those would be essential. Um, so we decided to test that. So we first of all chopped off the end, making a, a t well, which is half the protein. Uh, and these animals were very close to wild type uh, in the 
um, tests that we did. Um, so we then, uh, encouraged by this, went further, and this is uh, Becky Tillotson's work. Um, she uh, removed the middle as well and, and um, just leave, uh, leave, left a protein that's uh, about a third the size of the native protein. And uh, my guess is this film isn't going to work either. Oh, it does. That's funny. Um, okay, so that mouse has, uh, if you see on the left, it has the mini gene uh, and it's a year, nearly a year old. It's 48 weeks old. So, in other words, um, this, this uh, protein can uh, sustain life um, uh, well beyond the period when no MECP2 would, uh, would be lethal. Uh, we also put it into um, a, uh, uh, we put a stock cassette inside that gene, uh, which we could then remove so that the animals could grow up with no MECP2, and then we could switch on this mini MECP2. And then this shows the, yeah, uh, this shows uh, that uh, animals in red that are controls uh, that still have the stop don't survive. That's their declining numbers. Uh, whereas if you activate with tamoxifen the, the mini gene, then all of the mice survived in this experiment. And in fact, uh, what we can say is that uh, a mini gene allows mice to survive and thrive. Uh, and delayed activation reverses the phenotype. And also you can deliver this in a viral vector and uh, it has a strong rescuing effect on the phenotype. So now uh, transcription, I see I'm nearly running out of time, but um, this, this shows that um, the co-repressor recruitment that we hypothesize would be where you get a lot of co-repressor recruitment, you should get a lot of repression of transcription. Uh, and so uh, you should, would expect genes that bind a lot of MECP2 to increase more when MECP2 is taken away than genes that have a little. And this shows that's the case. That on the left, the green curve shows that the more MECP2 binding sites per gene, the more those genes go up when MECP2 is removed. And the same set of genes on the right, when you overexpress MECP2, then those genes go down. And this was done by uh, Justina Kolovavakla in uh, Human uh, Dopaminergic Neurons in Culture. And the same thing is true if you just take random genes. I mean, these are actually genes involved in neurological disorders, but uh, the same would be true of large numbers of genes if you just uh, look, there is this uh, effect of increased binding, increased expression when you take away MECP2, decreased expression when you add too much. And uh, so, so this fits with the idea that actually large numbers of genes are regulated by this protein, not a few, and also their regulation is relatively subtle. You're not looking at switching on or off of genes, you're looking at modulation. So, uh, um, I don't know if the, the, the computer will explode when I get to zero, which it's about to do. Um, it just simply goes red. Um, so genes are dysregulated in both knockout and MM2. This is the last piece of information I'm going to give you. The knockout uh, dysregulates genes in the brain. And uh, the, what, the alternative model that we made with the protein that can't bind methyl CAC also deregulates genes. And those genes overlap, and the pink shows the overlap there. So the question you can ask is, uh, do, they, uh, do they do the same thing? And the answer is they do. The ones that go up when you can't bind methyl CAC are the same as the ones that go up when you don't have MECP2 at all. And interestingly, those genes are enriched for genes that are quite interesting uh, in the sense that they are implicated in... Um, uh, pervasive developmental disorder, autism spectrum disorder, etc. And some of those genes are listed down the side there. Uh, well, in fact, that, that is, those are the, the, all the genes that come up uh, in these disease go terms. Uh, so there's ORTS2 and there's uh, MEF2C and the proteins that have been implicated in uh, autism spectrum disorders generally. And so um, uh, the, the other thing that about those genes is they have and I'm not going to go through this uh, picture, but except to say that they are, have more methyl CAC than normal by quite a lot. That's this little cluster here. And uh, they are, their transcription is affected more than normal. So the reason why I'm telling you about this is because it's possible that um, all that, that the uh, effects of MECP2 deficiency on transcription um, are uh, due to an imbalance in thousands of genes and therefore the whole thing is slightly skew with, 
and, uh, and, and so you end up with a suboptimal neuron. Entirely possible. An alternative possibility, which is kind of uh, supported circumstantially by this uh, uh, data, is that there are a few genes that matter more than other genes. And uh, those obviously would be clinically interesting if one could uh, find out whether or not they really are implicated. And so this is really a, a pointer for the future. We'd like to know whether there are some genes whose dysregulation matters more than others uh, and could therefore maybe provide therapeutic uh, options. So that brings me uh, to the summary slide, which is uh, MECP2 is required throughout life, but is dispensable for early brain, brain development. Primary function of MECP2 is to recruit NCOR co-repressors to methylated sites in the genome. Um, Non-canonical CAC methylation is an essential target for MECP2 function in neurons. And I should say there's other evidence for this based on DNA methyltransferase knockouts and HUD uh, uh, has been, a lab has been uh, contributing to this. Um, MECP2 restrains the transcription of thousands of genes in a DNA methylation dependent manner. That's why it's been difficult to study because it's not a switch, it's a modulator and that's more difficult to detect. Uh, and um, uh, are a few dysregulated genes major contributors to ret contributors to ret syndrome? Actually, we don't know, but we're looking at it. And finally, just for coming back to the original Blue Squires question, the variable low density of DNA methylation throughout the genome has a function. That's what this data says. I think increasingly we're getting uh, that belief. Uh, and that function is to modulate transcription gro globally, if you like to optimize transcription in, in cells such as neurons. So finally, um, I, uh, this is a team effort. Uh, I've had a large numbers of really excellent people. I've been very fortunate in that working with me. Uh, these, this is a picture from a couple of years ago of the people who are in my lab now. And I just highlight uh, some of the individuals, John Connolly, Kashap, um, uh, 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 Matt List, Jackie Guy, uh, Jim Selfridge, uh, Becky Tillotson and Justina Kolovavakla, who I've, I hope I've mentioned on the way through, and of course our funders, Rett Syndrome Research Trust, and particularly uh, also those two, the Wellcome Trust and the Rett Syndrome Research Trust. Thank you very much for your attention. Apologies for going slightly too long. What do I do now? Take questions, is that true? Uh, yes, sorry, I didn't know if I had to come in. Uh, yes, uh, I see why. Uh, yes, uh, hello, Adrian. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for your talk. Uh, can you hear me well? Adrian? Yeah. Adrian, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, yes. Yes, okay. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I think it has uh, many different uh, aspects uh, for discussion and uh, there are several questions that are coming in. I hope uh, we can go through all of them and uh, maybe at the end I will have uh, also time to ask you uh, one or more questions. So we can start with uh, the question from Laura Andreae. And she's asking if there are any phenotypic features that persist uh, despite adult rescue. And if so, if you can speculate uh, as to what aspects of disrupt, disrupt, disrupted neural development uh, might be irreversible later. I, I also wonder a little bit if uh, the issue of uh, the total rescue may be due to the fact that uh, you are testing mice and perhaps uh, not all cognitive uh, features can be fully understand, understood. We've, uh, I mean, there's, uh, as you know, phenotyping is an endless process. Um, you, you never, there are always things you haven't tested. I would say the, the one thing that's really, uh, we haven't done so, uh, is, is in-depth cognitive testing. Uh, and, and that uh, has not been uh, tested properly. But um, I have to say there, 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 is a, uh, there is always this belief that, um, you know, um, there are critical periods in the development of the brain, and if you miss them, you can't go back. Uh, it's almost built into the um, neuroscience law. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, not, have, not coming from that background myself, uh, to me, it seems like if you correct nearly everything, everything you look at, then uh, uh, why shouldn't you also correct the other uh, uh, aspects as well? Yes. And we've looked at over a dozen things in collaboration with Stuart Cobb, uh, and, and they all reverse, including neuronal morphology. Uh, so um, I would predict 
that everything is going to be reversible, but then I would, wouldn't I? Uh, and that's, uh, we, we need to do more on the cognitive side, I think. Thank you. Next uh, question is by Isabel Mansui, and she's asking how much cell specificity is there in MCP2 functions, for instance, uh, are its binding partners different in different neuronal cell types? Are its uh, target genes different across cell types? So the answer to the uh, its binding partners, um, as far as we know, don't vary according to different cell types. In fact, if you look in HeLa cells or HEC293 cells or uh, mouse fibroblasts or neurons, um, they, they, it always binds, the primary thing it binds to is NCOR and also the nuclear localization signal binds to importins. Those are the big things you get. There are a few other proteins, um, but um, that we haven't, we are not aware of any differences in between the cell types. Regarding the, was the second one about the function? Uh, what was the second yes. component? Fu function. Different uh, um, target genes oh, yes. across different yes. cell types. So there are differences in, ge in gene expression because when the non-CG methylation is laid down, it is laid down in a way that depends on the gene expression pattern in that type of neuron. And so different neurons, uh, different types of neurons do have different gene expression patterns. And the Greenberg lab has shown some of this, and also Joe Ecker's lab has shown differences. And those differences are read by MECP2. So a protein that has a high density of methyl C, um, in, in one cell type has a low in another and you looks as though the gene expression corresponds with that. So it, it, it simply takes its cue from where the methylation is. Mm -hmm. per perfect. Uh, thank you. Next question is by Johannes Greff. Uh, he's asking if uh, MCP always has uh, a, represent, a repressive uh, function at all sites, uh, where it's uh, the binding. Well, that's difficult to answer. You know, you, 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 you have, we obviously have not looked at every side of what it's doing. Um, but um, the, the genes that go up are the genes where most, there is most bound. Some genes go down as well, but those genes are very low in MECP2 binding. So it, it doesn't look as though they, you know, they normally bind a lot and it activates them. It looks... I mean, it, it could be that it's just an equilibrium thing. If you only have a certain amount of transcription in a cell, uh, then uh, if you increase it somewhere, then somewhere else it has to decrease. It's very mm -hmm. common for epigenetic regulators to increase some genes and decrease others. It kind of redistributes transcriptional activity. I don't know of any strong evidence, I have to say, that MECP2 acts as a transcriptional activator. Great. Um, maybe one more question, a little bit uh, quick answer, if possible. Wait, uh, no. uh, Alina Salasova, uh, thank you very much for a great talk. Uh, I cannot get my head around why, while MCP2 is highly increasing in spinal cord, there is no effect uh, in uh, SC, specific uh, knockout. What's your opinion about this? Can it still affect the motor abilities slightly? Well, yeah, motor, I mean, um, gait is a major... Um, uh, um, a big thing that's affected in the mice and uh, the uh, people with Rett syndrome are quite often are wheelchair bound. So motor activity is profoundly affected by the knockout of MECP2. Exactly. So the answer is yes. We have a, a couple of other questions, also some questions by myself. We're going to keep them for the panel discussion. I think on the sake of time, we have to move now to the next uh, plenary speaker. But uh, thanks so much again, Adrian, uh, for a very interesting talk and also, I think, uh, wonderful discoveries. Thank you. Thank See you, you very soon. Much. Thank you. And now we are going to move to the next uh, talk uh, by Elisabeth Winder from the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich uh, in Germany. And she's going to tell us about prenatal stress, implications for risk trajectories in psychiatry. Elisabeth, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Carmen. And um, I would also like to really thank the organizers for inviting me um, to this really exciting meeting. So in my talk, I would like to focus on environmental risk factors for altered uh, neurodevelopment, uh, especially prenatal stress. So a number um, of large epidemiologic studies and twin studies have shown that exposure to adversity, especially adversity early in life, 
um, is a very strong and consistent risk factor for the later development of psychiatric disorders. Especially childhood trauma, child abuse have been linked with substantial increases for risk for psychiatric disorders. This I would like to focus on even earlier exposures to adversities, exposures that happen during pregnancy. And here again, a number of studies have shown that maternal depression or maternal psychiatric disorders during pregnancy or exposure of the mother to stress or trauma during pregnancy can actually lead to an increased risk of the offspring for metabolic disorders, but especially behavioral and psychiatric disorders. And a number um, of basic research studies um, and uh, studies in humans um, suggest that this increase in risk due to maternal um, psychiatric disorders or stress could be mediated by an increased exposure of the fetus to the stress hormone, to glucocorticoids. And this is also supported by the fact that synthetic glucocorticoids that are given in pregnancy um, with uh, complications uh, to have the fetus mature, especially earlier, um, are also associated with increased risk for behavioral uh, and cognitive symptoms. So I would like to illustrate some of these findings here um, with selected studies um, from many other studies published. So on the left, there is a study from a Finnish birth cohort uh, by Raikkonen and all published last year in JAMA, um, actually looking at over 700,000 um, children born either with exposure um, to synthetic glucocorticoids prenatally or not. And the treatment exposed children, and there were close to 15,000, actually showed a substantially higher prevalence of a diagnosis for mental or behavioral disorders. And this actually increased um, over, um, over time um, and the last time point what is not, was at nine years old. A number of studies have also shown that synthetic glucocorticoids given prenatally can also structure and function um, during childhood over longer time periods. And this is one example uh, from a study published in biological psychiatry showing cortical thinning in the right anterior cingulate cortex in children who had been exposed to prenatal synthetic glucocorticoids. So while a large number of studies um, actually show the association between prenatal stress and prenatal glucocorticoids and psychiatric and behavioral phenotypes, the, the, um, the, the mechanisms are um, still not very clear. A number of studies show that glucocorticoids could, act, could actually impact neurodevelopment. Uh, that's been shown in animal in vitro, but also suggested by uh, neuroimaging studies, um, that glucocorticoids alter the um, programming of the stress hormone axis in the offspring, and that prenatal stress could actually alter placental um, the offspring exposures to glucocorticoids. And what we're interested in is whether this environmental risk factor could actually embed itself with epigenetic changes that would then trigger all these changes observed in the different systems. So glucocorticoids bind to in cytoplasmic receptors, glucocorticoid or mineralocorticoid receptors, and when activated, these actually translocate to the nucleus, and since their transcription factor bind to specific response elements. And there they engender a transcriptional response, either up or down, regulating a number of genes. But what has also been shown is that glucocorticoid receptors, when bound to their response elements, can also lead to local epigenetic changes, especially a reduction in DNA methylation that opens the chromatin and then could prime the, a second response to glucocorticoids so that there is a memory of a first exposure of glucocorticoid receptor binding. And we wanted to explore whether this epigenetic memory to glucocorticoid exposure could actually be one of the mediators um, of risk to psychiatric disorder later, later in life. And so we looked at this um, in collaboration with Carmen et Pariante from King's College London um, using a multipotent hippocampal progenitor cell line, a human cell line that actually differentiates nicely into hippocampal granule neurons and has been shown to express synaptic markers, um, shows strong effects of glucocorticoids. 
And when we map the gene expression of um, this cell line to gene expression of fetal brain, it actually maps to the expression of second trimester fetal brain. So it seems to be a good model that uh, Janine Arlott and Nadine Provençal in my lab, lab actually explored further. And so what we did is we cell lines either during proliferation and differentiation to a glucocorticoid receptor agonist, dexamethasone or vehicle. And then we wanted to see whether there are effects on RNA expression and DNA methylation. We wanted to see whether these effects were actually lasting and added a washout period. And we wanted to see whether these effects were specific to treatment during proliferation and differentiation or also seen when we um, stimulated the cells after they had differentiated. So we then looked at genome-wide uh, DNA methylation and RNA expression at the time points indicated with the red arrow. And we observed substantial um, changes with dexamethasone in DNA methylation, both up uh, and down regulation, as well as for RNA expression with up to 20,000 CP or over 20,000 CPG significantly regulated and over 3,500 transcripts. I'd like to point your attention to two time points here. One is the time point with an early treatment and a washout. And what you can see there is that there are substantial differences in DNA methylation, but less differences in RNA expression. And if we actually treated the cells after they had differentiated, we saw almost no changes in DNA methylation and also very little changes in RNA um, expression, suggesting a certain sensitivity to a developmental window for these DNA methylation changes um, with glucocorticoid exposure. So we then looked at the DNA methylation changes in more detail and actually grouped the CPGs that are altered with dexamethasone over the different treatment uh, time points um, in specific trajectories. And we observed four distinct ones, um, either going down with methylation over differentiation or up. And the genes mapping to these CPGs were actually enriched for um, neurodevelopmental processes, but also uh, regulation of gene transcription. And when we actually looked at DNA methylation and RNA expression of a similar locus, we often saw anti-parallel regulation. So again, I would like to point um, out that for the washout, like the early treatment and washout time period, we saw in many genes substantial differences in DNA methylation, but no changes in RNA expression. Uh, and this is uh, now an illustration with a um, specific uh, gene locus that we've looked at for early adversities in a number of other contexts. And what you can see here is that um, for one CPG that's located here in a glucocorticoid response element, you see a substantial decrease uh, when treated during proliferation and difference. It's actually it's lasting when you treat the cells um, after they had differentiated. And it's not accompanied by concomitant changes in RNA expression. So we wanted to understand this in more detail. And we actually fine mapped the glucocorticoid response elements of FKBP5. And this is an example here on the left of the CPGs in the glucocorticoid response element of intron 7. And what you can see here is that dexamethasone exposure early on leads to a reduction in DNA methylation, both right after treatment, but also seven days later across many CPGs of that locus. So the whole locus seems to be affected by these changes in DNA methylation. And so what we did next is actually we took that enhancer, um, intronic enhancer, and uh, put it into a reported gene assay, either in a methylated or an unmethylated version. And what we did see is that the tensor function was not changed at baseline by methylation, but DNA methylation altered the extent to which this enhancer could actually be induced by glucocorticoids. So the non-methylated version was actually much more strongly induced by glucocorticoids than the methylated one. And so this suggested to us that if you have a decrease in DNA methylation in these enhancers, um, this is not paralleled by baseline transcriptional changes, but then if you re-stimulate 
um, that could actually lead to an enhanced transcription response later on. And so we wanted to explore um, this in more detail. And we first looked at all the CPGs um, that were actually changed with dexamethasone and mapped them to the enhancer and notation of the Chrome HMM um, database. And what we observed is that CPGs that actually showed dexamethasone responsivity in the differentiation phase, but also in washout, were enhanced for glucocorticoid response elements, flanking active transcription sites, but also enhancers. But even more interestingly, we got a very specific enrichment of bivalent and poised enhancers only in those CPGs that had these lasting effects um, only seen after early treatment and followed by a washout. So we wanted to understand whether the CPGs that are actually showing these lasting effects um, would be associated by an altered transcriptional response um, to a second stimulus to glucocorticoids. And that's why we added a second challenge to our initial experiment. So we repeated the experiment with the early treatment um, with the glucocorticoid receptor agonist dexamethasone, followed by a washout. But then we added an acute stimulus for four hours with a lower dose of this glucocorticoid receptor agonist. And we then looked at the transcriptional changes of the transcripts um, close to 4,000 that were closest um, to those CPGs that showed lasting changes in DNA methylation. And what we did observe is that this dual stimulation and early prolonged treatment uh, followed by an acute challenge led to a much stronger increase, uh, both in the range and the number of transcripts um, than any of the other stimulation, really suggesting that there is some sort of poising to a second transcriptional response. And so, this is why we now want to explore this hypothesis a bit further that an early exposure to glucocorticoids can lead to an epigenetic memory um, in specific types of enhancers that's not accompanied by baseline changes in gene transcription, but with a second stimulus actually unmasks an altered response that could actually uh, be relevant for trajectories um, to risk and resilience in psychiatric disorders. So we looked um, into the cell line um, to um, better understand effects of glucocorticoids on DNA methylation. And to better explore this in the context of um, human neurodevelopment, we wanted to explore whether cerebral organoids could actually serve as model systems to better understand the effects of, um, of glucocorticoids on human neurodevelopment. And this is work spearheaded by Cristiano Cusiano and Leander Doni uh, in my lab. And so what we first needed to know is whether the cerebral organoids um, actually express glucocorticoid receptor. And uh, this is an in situ hybridization of the glucocorticoid receptor protein. And you can see nice expression both around the ventricles, the neurons, and neural and progenitor outside. You also see an important functional aspect of, aspect of the glucocorticoid receptor that is it's translocating to the nucleus and it's actually activating a number of known glucocorticoid response genes. So showing that the glucocorticoid receptor is functional, we then wanted to explore the effects of glucocorticoid and acute challenge with glucocorticoid receptor agonists in three different cell lines um, using single cell sequencing. And so what we observed is that in these organoids, we get a nice distribution of mesenchymal cells, but neuro also neural progenitors and neurons, especially dorsal neurons. And when we looked at the expression of the glucocorticoid receptor, well, mesenchymal cells seem to express the glucocorticoid receptor more strongly. All the other cells also had substantial expression of the glucocorticoid receptor. So we next looked at expression after this acute challenge with dexamethasone. And what we observed is between 300 and close to 1,000 transcripts that were differentially expressed um, after this acute challenge with dexamethasone. And you can also see that there's a positive relationship between the expression level of the glucocorticoid receptor and the number of regulated genes. 
What was interesting too is that the transcripts that were activated by the glucocorticoid receptor seemed to be quite specific for the cell type. So there were only a few uh, transcripts that showed an overlap across all three cell types in being regulated by the glucocorticoid receptor agonist. And these were actually enriched for GO terms related to brain development, but also brain DNA binding. So in my presentation so far, I focused a lot on environmental risk factors, that is prenatal stress um, and synthetic glucocorticoid. And so psychiatric disorders um, have a contribution of both genetic risk and environmental risk. And what we wanted to understand is whether there's a convergence of the pathways between genetic risk and environmental risk um, on these disorders. So I'm not sure um, the slides are now completely blurred for me, so I know, I'm not sure you can actually see that. Um, so we first uh, wanted to understand whether the transcripts that we found activated by dexamethasone actually overlap um, with um, genes that have been associated with autism spectrum disorder or neurodevelopmental disorders or height as a comparative. And what we observed is that, is that those transcripts that were regulated in neurons, but not in non-neuronal cells or progenitors, were actually significantly enriched for transcripts that had shown genetic associations with autism disorders and neurodevelopmental disorders. We then also looked um, at the genome-wide association studies across eight different disorders published in Cell last year and also looked at the overlap of our glucocorticoid-induced transcripts. And again, we found a highly significant enrichment um, of the transcripts um, activated in neurons, but not in neural progenitors with these, um, with these genetic um, associations here, suggesting that the transcript activating neurons could be very important for psychiatric risk. So we then wanted to explore this um, in more detail and looked at the GWAS catalog uh, and categorized, um, the trans, uh, categorized the GWAS into either brain and behavior related or other traits. And then we wanted to see whether transcripts um, in neurons that are activated in three different cell lines actually overlapped with the GWAS um, signals and also better understand with which C uh, GWAS signals they overlap. So what we saw is that the top GWAS signals where we showed a strong overlap uh, were actually, and this is marked in orange, related to brain and behavior. And across all the three different cell lines, we saw a strong enrichment of traits related to adventurousness, irritability, um, mood swings and depression and neuroticism. And when we looked at the distribution um, of the map GWAS between brain and behavior traits and other traits, um, and the ones that actually show significant enrichment of our neuronal transcripts, we saw an over-representations of these brain and behavior traits um, across all three different cell lines, suggesting a convergence of this environmental challenge on the neurons um, or genetic risk factors for brain and behavioral traits. So finally, what we wanted to understand um, is a bit more functionally to go in detail for one transcript um, as an example of a gene that's strongly activated by glucocorticoids or stress, um, ZBD16, it's a transcription factor, um, but mutations in ZBD16 has been associated with autism and schizophrenia, and common variants um, in this gene have been associated with, develop, uh, with um, educational attainment. So a gene where we have both genetic factors and environmental factors that um, could actually be related to risk. When we looked at a gene expression, single cell gene expression of ZPD16 after a seven day challenge um, with gluco um, glucocorticoids, we saw a strong increase suggesting that there could be an interesting mechanism here. When we go back to this gene locus um, into our multipotent hippocampal progenitor cell data, 
we actually saw that there is an epigenetic effect, a change in DNA methylation, the enhancer of ZPD16. Uh, and this enhancer um, is actually an enhancer that's active both in fetal brain as well as in adult brain, suggesting that there could be an interesting convergence of genetic factors and environmentally induced epigenetic factors in the regulation of that gene. So this is a project that's now been taken uh, over by Antti uh, Ant Contira, a graduate student in my lab. And what she showed first was uh, the trajectory of expression of ZPD16, um, looking at um, cerebral organoids from day six all the way to day 100. And what she showed is that ZPD16 is highly expressed early during these um, early cerebral organoid phases. But as soon as early neural markers come up, like MAP2, ZPD16 goes down. And what she wanted to understand is whether glucocorticoids could actually alter this developmental time trajectory. And so she looked um, at organoids at day 50 where ZPD16 is already down and you can see there's very little red ZPD16 staining in the day 50 um, they did 50 organoids. And when stimulated with dexamethasone for seven days, there's actually a strong increase of ZPD16 on the RNA as well as on the protein side. So the question was that, okay, what's happening if I actually manipulate or increase the expression of a transcription factor that's tightly developmentally regulated? What actually happens with um, brain development or neurodevelopment? And for this, uh, Antti did uh, in neutral electro mouse uh, models, um, and she overexpressed ZBD16 uh, uh, in mouse at embryonic um, day 13, and then looked um, at the expression and the brain development at embryonic day 16, so three days later. And what she observed is that with the overexpression of ZBD16, um, there's actually a change in the development um, and the transitioning and the maturation of progenitors to neuron. And when she looked at that in more detail by staining with an early progenitor marker POC6 and a more mature progenitor marker TRB2, she found that um, cells that were double labeled for POC6 and TBR2, so transitioning progenitors, were actually increased while more mature progenitors that only stain for TBR2 were decreased. So the hypothesis is that ZPD16 actually lead to an increased sort of um, level of these very early transitioning progenitors and a decrease of more mature um, intermediate progenitors and by this change the architecture of cortical development. So, our hypothesis is that early glucocorticoids um, could actually lead to epigenetic um, memory or a change in the epigenetic set point of specific enhancers that could be important um, also for developmentally regulated um, genes such as ZBZ16 so that we shift the developmental trajectory with exposure to glucocorticoid or prenatal stress. And by shifting the timing of the expression of these critical um, factors, um, we actually alter um, the neurodevelopmental um, trajectory of progenitors to mature neurons. We're now exploring this in more detail, also using more, um, more model systems and um, uh, more organoid uh, data. And we also want to explore the binding of the transcription uh, factors at BD16 to better understand the molecular um, pathways here. So to end uh, my talk, I would like to summarize um, that we like to explore, hypothesize that prenatal stress um, leaves increased risk um, for the offspring by, at least in part, effects of prenatal exposure to glucocorticoids that can lead to lasting epigenetic uh, changes, especially in bivalent or poised enhancers. The effects of prenatal glucocorticoids are cell type specific and may also be specific to certain developmental stages. Especially effects in neurons seem to map onto risk genes for psychiatric developmental disorders. 
Um, and while affecting transcription factors, this could have profound effects on neural development. And finally, there's a convergence of genetic and environmental risk factors on similar gene sets. And we're currently exploring in more detail the interaction between genetic and environmental risk factors to better understand factors contributing to risk versus resilience, and maybe um, also better understand how we could intervene early on. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and a large number uh, of members of my team at the Max Planck Institute um, and other groups at the Max Planck Institute and a number of international um, and national collaborators and the funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, it's been uh, very clear, even if you saw it blurred. Uh, the technical uh, office uh, told me that uh, the attendees should be watching, seeing it very well. So I think. Uh, oh, okay, good. <laughs> I was worried be because I could not read any word anymore. <laughs> Yes, no, I think you did great. And uh, yeah, again, very interesting data as well. I think uh, we have uh, many things, uh, many points to discuss. I'm going to start with the questions uh, from the attendees. Uh, the first one from Prakash uh, Devaraju uh, says the dexamethasone is a more potent corticosteroid than cortic corticosterone or cortisol, for example. How do you compare the treatment to a stressful maternal event, for example? Yeah, no, how do you compare what you're. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is, a, this, is, this is a good point. So we first chose to look at dexamethasone because it's relative selective for the glucocorticoid receptor. Um, we also have shown that the other receptor that binds to glucocorticoid, the mineral corticoid um, receptor, actually has very low expression in the brain organoids. So we think the effects are mainly mediated uh, by, um, by the glucocorticoid receptor in this um, developmental phase, at least in the organoid model. I've looked into uh, looking uh, at cortisol. We see similar gene expression changes, but it's very clear that they also that the receptor binding dynamics are different. Um, so we first focused on the effects of synthetic glucocorticoids, and but I agree it's very important to really map all the effects also of cortisol. But there's the, like the dose is very um, is very important to understand because even though um, we think that there is an increased exposure with prenatal stress um, to the fetus, the extent of the exposure and the level of the exposures are unclear. It's much more clear how synthetic glucocorticoids actually go through the placenta and then impact the fetus. It makes sense. Uh, thank you. Next question is by Isabel Mansui, and she's asking how persistent is the poison of enhancers by glucocorticoids? Do you know if it depends on the severity and or in the duration of stress, perhaps also its nature? Maybe the type of stressors? <laughs> Yeah, excellent question. So what, what we do know is that they persist for 20 days. Um, we have not looked any any further in the in the organoids so far. Um, so it would be interesting, and we're we're doing that also in collaboration uh, with Matthias Schmidt at the institute to actually look at animal models of prenatal stress and then really see how long whether we actually can replicate this poisoning um, also in the, in the in a whole organism with a prenatal stressor um, and how long it's lasting. So this is a good question, but that, that we cannot really answer with organoids. We could go for longer days. That's what we're also planning, but right now it's like three weeks. Excellent. Excellent. Laura Andrea, Laura, it's yeah, uh, asking so maternal so immune so activation or infection, infection can also lead to neuropsychiatric effects. Do you think that the stress response might be playing a part in this? And have you looked if there might be convergent targets or pathways? Yeah, no, this is, this is an excellent question. So, um, I've looked at, um, together with, um, Sonia, Sonia Entringer and, and colleagues at the Charité is that when we look at the placenta, um, of babies that have been exposed to beta metazone, um, like another synthetic glucocorticoid, um, there are actually epigenetic changes, um, in genes um, like one is FKBP5, but actually when we look at the co-expression pattern of the genes uh, changed by beta metasone, we get a strong enrichment also of immune genes. So there could be a convergence of the effects of immune activation and glucocorticoids on the placenta, and then by altering placenta function actually impact the baby. Yeah, it adds complexity, but I think uh, building the blocks <laughs> uh, slowly, that's the way to go. 
And the next question is by Navneet Vashista, and he or she says, interesting work. I was wondering whether you see that all neuronal subtypes are equally affected after the exomethasone exposure, or if you see some subtypes that escape its impact. I think you answered a little bit. Also, you were talking about differences in the GR expression. I was also wondering to what extent is the cell type that defines or the different dosage of the receptor as well, the, the findings that you have. Yeah, so like one thing is we, we see a global effect of the uh, of the expression of glucocorticoid receptor level on the number of transcripts. But we have cells that have similar levels um, of GR expression, but still show different transcripts that are, are activated. So we think there are some cell type specific effects of, of GR action on that. And so we looked at the subsets um, of cells and like we're we're, we're increasing um, this mapping by adding a sort of more sort of more cell lines and more organoids to this data set. But so far we could see the strongest effect when we looked like when we subdivided the progenitors in radial glia and dorsal neurons. The question is that the organoids that we had mainly produced dorsal neurons. So we now want to look into organoids doing better neurons and um, organoids also having more glial cells to really get a better picture. So that's why. Um, I presented the more condensed data because I think it's more robust than going the fine grained cell types and needs more work to actually be more sure mm -hmm. about that. Thank you. Rodrigo Grassi Oliveira says, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding evidences uh, about hypocortisolemia related to chronic postpartum depression or PTSD instead of a hypercortisolemia background? Like, so depending on the context also of the individual. Yeah. I mean, I think what, what's interesting and what, what I think still, still lacks investigations is when we talk about hyper or hypocortisolemia, um, th that we need to look at what, what actually is the signal that, that is seen by the cell. Uh, um, of the different... Um... Okay, can you hear me yeah. again? We lost you a little bit, eh? but please eh, give it a chance. Eh? Okay, no, it's, it's just so, sort of the, the idea of that, that the peripheral levels of glucocorticoid need to match the sensitivity of the target genes. And so I would, be, I would think it would be very interesting to really look at the combination of the peripheral, like the, the, the serum or plasma levels of glucocorticoids, and then the gene transcription changes that we see, because it could be that some of the epigenetic changes actually alter the set point so that even if the system is hypocortisolemic, it could still have an enhanced activity of GR response in some of the target genes. So, yeah, I'm not sure this really answers your question, but I think it's, it's like hypo or hyper. I think what really matters is what by the cell and the, and the, and the genes. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Yeah. Samia Joka is, says also, thanks for the excellent presentation. Do you think that drugs that modulate DNA methylation could be potentially interesting to target the stress-induced DNA methylation and behavioral changes? Yes, mm -hmm. excellent question. Um, I know that um, colleagues in the Netherlands, uh, Christian Winkers and colleagues, are actually looking at that um, to see whether, uh, whether by, by sort of targeting GR-induced epigenetic changes, one could also... Um, manipulate or actually have beneficial effects on childhood trauma um, risk. So I think the, the, the challenge is how to target it. Um, and they're using a um, RU486, um, 586, uh, um, to actually induce these epigenetic changes, but this is not really an epigenetic, um, and it, well, it's binding to the GR, but this has epigenetic changes. challenge is to really have a specific targeting of these epigenetic um, modifiers. Yeah, I think this is also a, an important topic for the discussion panel afterwards. And then perhaps last question here by Sri Lakshmi Joshi. Uh, have you tested the levels of ubiquitination profile in CBTV mutants? In the mutants, no. in the CBTV ubiquitination? No. Mm -hmm. The ZBD16. CBTV. Ubiquitination, if you measure ubiquitination. But I'm not sure what mutants um, are talked about, but 
Okay, the last part of your talk. We have, not looked, we have not looked at UV retination yet, no. Very good. Yeah, uh, let's perhaps on the sake of time move and then uh, keep a few more questions for later for the panel discussion. I, I think I would be particularly interested also in hearing more about the priming uh, concept uh, and then whether or not sensitization versus uh, habituation, for yeah. example, in the trajectories, etc. But thanks so much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I will see you soon for the panel discussion. Yes. Thank you. And now we are moving to the flash talks. Uh, each of them, as you know, it's going to be five minutes. So please be attentive to send your questions uh, that all of them will be given to the three uh, presenters uh, after the three talks. Uh, so the first one, it's going to be by Anna Starnavska from our house uh, university. And uh, she's going to tell us about integrative uh, genomic and epigenomic analysis of uh, autism spectrum disorder. Hello, Anna. We are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anna Starnaska and I am postdoc in ISAC. And today I would like to talk to you about our findings from project Integrative Genomic and Epigenomic Analysis of Autism Spectrum Disorders. Mm. Uh, we performed this project in the ISAC methylomic sample where we had access to over 2,000 Danish individuals. For these individuals, we had access to neonatal dried blood spots from which we extracted DNA. This DNA was used for epigenomic profiling with the use of epicaray, and we also had genotyping data available. As for the clinical data, we had access to ICD-10 codes from Danish registers on autism, ADHD, and we also confirmed that our population-based controls don't have autism or ADHD. Mm. Uh, with this data set, we were able to ask different questions. The first question that we asked was, are there any DNA methylation differences between autism cases and controls at the time of birth? Mm. To answer this question, we performed an epigenome-wide association study, EWAS, of autism, and our findings are visualized by this Manhattan plot. As you can see, we did not have any epigenome-wide significant findings, but mm. among our top genes, we had genes that were before associated with autism, and also with other mental disorders like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. We then extended this analysis to mm. differentially methylated regions, and we identified 32 significant DMRs to be associated with autism diagnosis. This karyogram shows you genes annotated to these DMRs. 48% of these genes were reported before to undergo dynamic methylation changes during fetal brain development. Just to highlight a few of these genes, some of them were found to be very important for synapse formation and neuronal differentiation, and other ones were implicated in developmental delay and behavioral abnormalities. So these are findings for autism diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But then we also asked a different question. Is autism polygenic burden associated with DNA methylation changes in the human genome? Mm -hmm. To answer this question, we performed EWAS of autism polygenic risk score, and this Manhattan plot visualizes our findings. Mm -hmm. We actually replicated um, findings from Hanon and co-authors from 2011, uh, 2018, where they found elevated polygenic burden of autism to be associated with differential DNA methylation at birth. Uh, we also found the same locus with differential methylation changes at chromosome 8 as they did. We then extended this analysis to differential methylated regions, and we found 27 significant DMRs to be associated with autism polygenic risk score. 57% uh, of these uh, genes that you can see here were reported to undergo dynamic methylation changes during fetal brain development. And just to highlight a few of these loci, for example, our findings on chromosome 3 and 5, they were also found to be associated as DMRs, but with autism diagnosis. Mm. In turn, the finding in chromosome 8, it actually reflects what you saw on the previous slide, the Manhattan plot signal for differentially methylated positions. And we know from the work of Hanon and co-authors that autism risk SNPs that reside on chromosome 8, they act as methylation quantitative trait, trait loci, MQTLs, to alter methylation levels in that region. That led us to ask the last question. 
Where else in the genome autism risk SNPs act as MQTLs? Mm. To answer this question, we performed MQTL analysis for all SNPs uh, that reside in autism risk loci. Here you can see Manhattan plot from autism GWAS, and I marked in red the loci. Actually, on chromosome 20, there are two loci. Uh, for all these uh, SNPs, we performed MQTL analysis, and in this way, we identified over 260 unique genes with altered DNA methylation. These genes were then subjected to pathway enrichment analysis, and among our top significantly enriched pathways, we found neuronal differentiation, neurogenesis, cell cell signaling, and neuron development. Mm. So to briefly sum up, in this project, we used three different statistical approaches to investigate epigenetic contributions to autism. We observed DNA methylation changes in genes related to neurodevelopment and mental disorders to be associated with autism. And we also confirmed that part of this autism epigenetic signature to be driven by autism risk variants. This only highlights the importance of combining different types of molecular data to study complex disorders. And now we're performing meta-analysis and replication to confirm these findings. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say thank you for the project team, the Foundation, for funding the study, and you for listening. Thanks so much, Anna, for very interesting data and also advancement in the topic. I would like now to introduce Leandros Bukas from John Hopkins University. He's going to tell us about uh, leveraging the Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery to systematically map functional epigenetic variation. Leandros, uh, the screen is yours. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks to the organizers for this great opportunity to present our work here. Uh, and what I'd like to do is try to give a very brief overview of why we think that the Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery can provide a principled approach for uh, systematically mapping causal disease-associated epigenetic variation. Uh, so this is a uh, class of disorders that, that, that we'll abbreviate as MDEMs, and they are caused by loss of function variants in genes encoding epigenetic regulators. Uh, here I'm showing what we call the MDEM pizza, uh, where each slice depicts an epigenetic regulator gene that has an associated uh, MDEM in OMIM. And there are currently 82 such uh, MDEM-associated epigenetic regulators, but we anticipate that uh, this, list is, uh, this list is going to expand a lot more based on a comprehensive analysis of the human epigenetic machinery that we performed a couple years ago, where we found that um, the majority of such genes, even those without an associated MDEM to date, are highly intolerant to loss of function variation, as shown here with the red distribution. Uh, so, one thing that is uh, really interesting about MDEMs is that even though different MDEMs have different causative genes, the affected individuals have many uh, overlapping phenotypic manifestations. And the prime example of this phenotype sharing is intellectual disability. Here, the, the blue color that uh, we can appreciate uh, spans almost the entire circle corresponds to intellectual disability. And what this depicts is that almost all of these MDEMs have intellectual disability as part of their phenotype. And there are several other uh, such uh, shared phenotypes, including growth abnormalities, immune dysfunctions, uh, seizures, as well as others. And our hypothesis, um, uh, which we describe uh, and test in this new preprint, uh, is that this phenotypic overlap is a consequence of uh, overlap at the epigenomic and or transcriptomic level, which it itself arises as a downstream effect of the distinct primary genetic defects. And if this hypothesis is true, it means that we can design experiments where we jointly analyze multiple MDEMs. Here I'm just showing two for convenience. And what we do is we is first separately for each MDEM, we identify loci with disrupted chromatin accessibility or genes with disrupted expression. And then we intersect the results across uh, uh, all of these MDEMs. And what we get is a list of common differential alterations. And if our hypothesis is correct, we anticipate that this list of common alterations will be enriched for alterations with a causal involvement in disease pathogenesis and will not be as contaminated by noise or passenger effects, which are a much bigger problem in individual analysis. So to test this hypothesis uh, and for a pre first proof of principle, we performed attack and RNA sequencing in uh, B cells from the peripheral blood of mouse models of three MDEMs, Kabuki uh, syndrome types 1 and 2 and Rubinstein-Tabi type 1. 
And I'm not going to go into the details, of course, uh, but I will mention that we developed a new statistical approach in order to do this cross-disorder analysis with adequate power. And this allowed us to see that, indeed, the three disorders share a, a large number of common chromatin alterations, as shown here with these conditional p-value distributions and with the log fold chain scatter plots at the, at the bottom, which show a, um, a concordant direction of effect in the, in the different disorders. And not only this, but when we focused on gene on disrupted gene promoter pairs, we found that there is a strong correlation between the direction in which promoter accessibility changes and the direction in which downstream gene expression changes. And uh, in addition to that, when we focused on genes whose promoters uh, show disrupted accessibility in all three MDEMs uh, we looked at, these genes had a higher probability of being of having dysregulated expression compared to genes whose promoters showed disrupted accessibility in either one or two of the disorders, which supports our initial hypothesis that the common hits, the shared hits, uh, have a higher chance of being functionally important. So, to summarize, um, uh, we believe that the study of the Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery provides a principled approach for systematically mapping causal disease-associated epigenetic variation. And the fact that MDEMs have a multitude, a multitude of organ systems commonly affected means that this approach can be applied to a variety of phenotypes, including neuropsychiatric ones. And then, finally, uh, even though MDEMs are simple Mendelian disorders with respect to their inheritance patterns, we believe that the molecular Molecular pathogenesis is more similar to what we see with common complex disease, with multiple subtle alterations distributed widely throughout the entire genome. So I'd like to thank Teresa, uh, with whom we worked closely together and who did uh, all the experiments in this study, um, Casper and Hans. This is our preprint here. We'd love to get feedback on it. And I'd also like to highlight um, uh, our comprehensive analysis of the epigenetic machinery on the left, which we did a couple of years ago. And I will also mention that uh, the lab is very interested in therapeutics for the postnatal reversibility of intellectual disability in Kabuki syndrome. And the latest study on that front is shown uh, on the right. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, uh, Leandro. Uh, I think it's a very interesting approach. Uh, and now we, I would like to uh, introduce Mandy Meyer from the Radwood University Medical Center in the Netherlands. And she's going to tell us about cell type specific uh, DNA methylation. It's associated with childhood attention, ADHD, uh, and disorder symptoms. Uh, Mandy, uh, welcome and um, all the best with your talk. Yes, thank you. And thanks for the organizers to give me the chance to present part of my PhD project. Um, ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is a neurodevelopmental disorder with a prevalence of 5% in children. But the symptoms are also present as a continuum in the general population. And ADHD is thought to be highly heritable. Heritability is uh, estimated to be up to 80% based on twin studies. But also the environment plays an important role, like early life stress, as we heard before, or prenatal toxin exposure. And the genetics and the environment work together via uh, DNA methylation. And DNA methylation regulates gene expression and eventually behavior. Oh, um, the previous study showing DNA uh, or performing EWA studies um, of ADHD or ADHD symptoms have shown that genes are involved in the immune system, neuronal development, or neurotransmitter systems. However, most of these studies have been performed in uh, bulk tissue like whole blood, uh, consisting of multiple cell types. And uh, DNA methylation profiles are thought to be highly cell type specific. So if you look at bulk DNA methylation, it might be that you miss meaningful signal simply because two cell types uh, DNA methylation profiles cancel each other out. So our research question was, which cell type specific DNA methylation patterns are associated with ADHD symptoms? For this, we used the Great Smoky Mountain study, a longitudinal cohort, and we used 583 children. And ADHD symptoms were assessed with the parent and child interviewer-based structure diagnostic interview. We assess DNA methylation with methyl CPG binding domain, domain sequencing, and we were able to cover almost all 28 million CPG sites in the human genome, which is way more than the uh, commercial arrays often used for these type of studies. And the DNA methylation was measured in peripheral whole blood. Uh, 
So if we have DNA methylation in bulk tissue, how then do we go to cell type specific DNA methylation? And for this, we compared our DNA methylation in bulk to a reference panel on estimated cell type proportion. If we have the estimated cell type proportion of a cell and the DNA methylation uh, values in bulk for all the individuals with a given ADHD score, we can extrapolate the DNA methylation values to the point where the proportion of our cells should be one. And this is the cell type specific DNA methylation value. We can do this for every cell type, for every CPG site, for every individual. And then we built a linear model, a regression model, uh, to uh, assess DNA methylation for each cell type uh, for the ADHD symptoms, and we regress relevant covariates out of the model. We did not find any significant results in the bulk tissue, but we did identify 24 significant hits in monocytes and 16 in granulocytes. And interestingly, we found overlapping uh, top hits in both uh, cell types in the gene spider, but the effect sizes of the DNA methylation were exactly the opposite in the two cell types, indicating why we could not find this signal in bulk cells. For our monocytes, our top hit was located in MGOT5B, which is associated with schizophrenia, highly expressed in the brain needed for brain development. And overall, top hits had co-term enrichment for calcium ion binding. In granulocytes, we found that our top hit was located in SEMAC4D, a gene involved in excellent guidance, also needed for brain development. And a previous study has found that SEMAC4D signaling was already associated with ADHD. And top hits in granulocytes were enriched uh, for the gene ontology terms of neuropeptide receptor activity. So in short, uh, to conclude, cell type specific DNA methylation might help to find biological roles for genes in ADHD, because now we're really looking into the profiles of specific cell types instead of looking at a marker for a bulk tissue. We also looked into the different symptom domains to see of ADHD to see whether these profiles were driven by the inactive, uh, inattentive domain or the hyperactive domain, but these profiles seem to be driven by the complete package of the symptoms. We also looked at the stress interaction, so really look what the effect of the environment is in ADHD. And we were able to uh, predict future ADHD symptoms uh, based on the methylation risk score. And currently we are trying to replicate our findings by performing a meta-analysis in array-based samples uh, of the PACE consortium. And with that, I would like to thank all the people that were directly involved in this project. Thanks so much uh, to the three speakers uh, from these flash talks. Uh, we have uh, a few questions already, and I think uh, people might be sending a few others uh, in the meantime. So we are going to start with uh, Anna. Uh, the question is from Rosanna Foti, and uh, she's asking if uh, you've checked uh, RNA expression for the genes that show differential DNA methylation in your study? Uh, we did not look into the differential methylation versus expression comparison yet. Uh, for now, I think that our focus is more to try to replicate our findings in similar cohorts, for example, in the Minerva cohort, and then meta-analyze, and then once we can confirm that our methylation findings are actually reproducible across different cohorts, uh, then I would go more into looking into what these methylation changes can mean for expression. I see. Thank you. Next uh, question is uh, for uh, Leandro. Uh, how do your findings, uh, the question is from Rugil Matulevicute, and the question is, how did your findings relate to DNA methylation, epigenetic studies of patients with MDMs, if there are any? any yeah, ones? so that, that's, that's a... So that's a good question. So it, it's it's somewhat different because uh, our our study is specifically designed to capture um, uh, epigenetic changes that are uh, at the core of the pathogenesis of these uh, uh, of these disorders. Whereas these DNA methylation studies, uh, their goal is um, uh, prediction. So they want to be able to uh, use uh, to derive DNA methylation signatures and use them, say, for classification of variants of unknown significance and things like that. And there is no guarantee that what they're finding is 
uh, really relevant, causally relevant to the pathogenesis because for one, they're looking at uh, whole blood, which is a, a mixture of uh, several cell types, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important in epigenomic studies. Uh, but also second, uh, these uh, disorders for, in which these DNA methylation signatures have, have been applied to, most of them are disorders of the histone machinery or disorders of chromatin remodelers. So the DNA methylation changes that they pick up are by definition secondary events. Whereas here we're doing attack sequencing, so we're capturing uh, uh, chromatin changes in disorders whose primary pathogenesis involves chromatin changes. So uh, I mm -hmm. think that the scope is, they might sound different, they might sound similar, but the scope is very different. Thank you, Leandro. Sam. Now a question for Mandy. This is from Prakash de Barayu, and uh, he says, nice talk. The cell type uh, specificity are from peripheral blood cells. Will those translate directly to brain cells? Can you compare monocytes to microglia, or how do you see uh, your kind of a transference uh, to the brain? Yes, that's a really good question. I certainly do not think that these profiles are directly translatable to brain cells. Um, what I do think is interesting in the case of ADHD, that we're looking at immune-related cells, is because there is a genetic and also phenotypical overlap between ADHD and immune diseases. So I do think here that these... Uh, immune genes can have a more biological role than simply be a marker. Also, what is known is that under stress or excessive conditions, for example, when there are excessive amounts of granulocytes in the body, that they can uh, damage the blood-brain barrier and also communicate with astrocytes. So there might be a role there, but I definitely do not think that these profiles reflect what is happening in the brain. Thank you, uh, Mandy. And then there is a, a follow-up question from Celia Bosso Lefebvre for you that is asking if you find differences in the methylation profile between males and females. Yes. So we uh, also. So I told that we were looking at the stress uh, effect, stress interaction. We also looked at the interaction uh, of uh, sex, uh, also based on a previous study that showed that there is this interaction between sex and, uh, and ADHD symptoms. We also try to do this, and here we find different patterns indeed, uh, also partially overlapping with the previous uh, published study. So sex is important you. to take into account. Now a final question for Anna that comes from Prakash Devarachu. And uh, he says, how do we take these associations with epigenetic changes in study mechanistic causes? Are these changes the result of some major causal mutation or are they changes uh, by themselves, causal mm -hmm. themselves? I think that it's something we start to gather data to answer these kind of questions. Uh, we now realize that, for example, coming from GWAS findings, when we start to characterize what the risk SNPs do to methylome, we can see that they do have an effect on DNA methylation landscape. But then we also have to start thinking where in the tissue and at which point these methylation changes actually take the biggest effect and when uh, these differences in methylation actually uh, influence the phenotype of interest most. I think it is mm -hmm. only with, you know, gathering more data and um, also combining genomic and epigenomic and, as Mandy mentioned, also the environmental uh, data, we will be able to answer these questions more in detail. Thanks so much uh, for presentations. And uh, so I would like now to really ask uh, everyone to try to think uh, on the bigger picture, perhaps not only the specific questions that we've been addressing, but... Uh, more where are we moving to, where should we go in the next 10 years, and what does it take to get there? So uh, I'm going to invite now all the speakers that we had until now, both the, the plenary speakers and also the flash talk uh, speakers, to join me for this uh, uh, plenary discussion. And um, hello, nice to see you again. Uh, yes, uh, also to be ready for this uh, uh, unexpected time, I think. Uh, this is part of the flexibility that perhaps uh, epigenetics uh, allows uh, to have uh, from a cognitive point of view.
And uh, now we want to address this question, which I think it's very important to have this type of uh, discussions and this type of panels to think uh, about the future. Also, maybe to also think uh, where are we standing until now and uh, where do we want to go and what's going to be possible also regarding uh, the different uh, progress. Uh, and one way to start uh, while we get some questions uh, from the attendees, I think it's to ask yourselves, each of you, to give a brief uh, uh, presentation and speech uh, on this particular question. Where are we standing now regarding this topic? Uh, and uh, where do you think we have, we can hope to be in 10 years from now? Perhaps let's go first uh, for this part of the question. Where will we be or where can we expect to be in 10 years per, uh, from now? And afterwards we will ask, uh, what does it take? What do we need to do in order to get there? And um, Adrian, I would like to ask you if you would like to start. Thank you. <clears throat> A nice, easy question. Uh, what's it going to be like in 10 years' time? Um, I'm sure if I were to listen to my predictions of what it would be like now, 10 years ago, they wouldn't be worth an awful lot. But um, I think f for me, um, the, the big change recently has been uh, genome sequencing, which has allowed us to attribute um, disorders that we had no idea of what their root was to genetic changes. And um, as uh, the speaker, uh, Leandros, actually, I don't see him anywhere. Is he, is he on the... Um, he, he, points, he, he was using genetics uh, where it affects epigenetic um, regulators of one sort or another, be they histone mo modifiers or uh, histone, um, you know, movers, um, to, um, to try to sort out the impact on disease. And I think <clears throat> disentangling the epigenetic and the genetic effects is going to be vital, uh, vitally important. Um, so, uh, for me, uh, a big question is the causality of the DNA methylation changes that are observed. <clears throat> because uh, I think on the one hand, um, DNA methylation is, a, is a quite a good marker uh, of exactly what. I think it's not so clear. <clears throat> but if you can use it predictively, then it doesn't matter what it's of. It could well be, for example, that gene expression changes um, or pro protein binding. Uh, I, I mean, the, um, the, 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 the picture that uh, Elizabeth showed of a change in the DNA methylation associated with an enhancer of, uh, of, of a gene in response to glucocorticoids, you know, this was a picture almost of the effects of um, protein binding on uh, the epigenetic landscape. You could argue that the, 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 the presence of the proteins was changing that. So, you know, understanding what's the cause and what's the effect. If the environment is changing the epigenome, what is the, the mechanism by which that, it, that happens? We know that hormones respond uh, to the external environment. Hormones affect gene expression. Then gene expression affects DNA methylation. And maybe that then knock on, knocks on to future gene expression uh, in ways that would be clinically interesting. But for me, that ch under establishing that chain of uh, events is quite important. I don't think anybody knows of a way in which the environment talks to the DNA methylation machinery or indeed to any epigenetic uh, marker directly. It's all done through the ways in which the, se the, the organism senses the environment anyway. And quite often, I think transcription is a key mediator of these effects. That doesn't mean it's all causal, uh, all consequential, because that change in methylation can then affect transcription subsequently. So to me, this is a difficult problem. The effects are not always huge. Um, the, you're, you, if you're do it looking clinically, you're doing it in an, an outbred uh, population. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that, that automatically makes it difficult. And, and looking in blood when you're talking about a brain disease, of course, adds another dimension of abstractness to it. Um, so uh, I think the challenges are huge. Um, but um, given the frequency with which epigenetic modifiers or, or readers or writers or whatever are um, 
uh, involved in human disease through genetic changes, it's somewhere we've, we've, we've got to go. But just to say, just in general, I know I'm going on a bit, but, um, you know, I think very often epigenetic changes are modulatory. And, and, and you could argue that that is why they're so heavily implicated in disease. Because if you, if you lose a switch, then uh, you do not survive. Uh, whereas if you lose a modulator, then you are suboptimal. And another word for suboptimal is sick. Um, so um, to me, the, the over-representation of epigenetic modifiers can be very simply and perhaps too simply explained by uh, the fact that most epigenetic changes are modulators, not switches of gene expression. So that's enough. I will. Um, and yeah, that's and my I, say. It's not a it... concrete prediction of the future, but... Uh, it's some thoughts. Yeah, we start uh, perhaps uh, seeing forward to the future, but I think it's a very good reflection of uh, where are the complexities. Uh, and indeed, you were talking about these mediators that are not so clear. But for me, something that is very intriguing is also, even if we already identify the mediator, let's imagine as uh, Elizabeth is proposing the glucocorticoids uh, as an important uh, um, effector, still this... Uh, specific changes uh, that occur in different uh, cell types, uh, but also in specific genes uh, that not all the genes get methylated. I think this specificity that should be given by properties probably of the DNA or other uh, different properties, uh, why is so specific? Like, for example, Elizabeth, your, your results regarding also uh, these uh, uh, findings of uh, GWAS, that are related to a brain behavior and also vulnerability to depression, etc. And I think uh, this understanding why those are not others, uh, for me, it's, uh, I think, a very important uh, question also to answer, because this would be one way to really explain the mechanistic uh, effects from environment to the mediator, but also why the DNA has a different uh, vulnerability. But uh, Elizabeth, perhaps uh, you can tell us uh, where do you would you like to see to be in ten years from now? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I want to make speculation where we should be in, in ten years, but I, I I think there 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 are efforts that that we need to where we need to map the epigenome on all the different levels. And so right now, often well, and. I also do the same, I focus on few epigenetic measures, but I think we need to integrate all of them in specific loci and understand their interaction. Um, also in a cell type specific and developmental um, way. So I think there, like, there are large efforts uh, now to do that, um, also in human tissues to really understand developmental trajectory and cell type specific trajectories of different epigenetic changes, but really bringing sort of different levels together in the cell type specific and, and time specific way is a challenge. And I think the next challenge is to then combine it with common genotypes and environments. And so I think, so one, I think we can do very well. And I, I think John would have talked about that uh, with postmortem brain, um, but cells that can actually react but still represent um, the complexity of the, the human genome. And so like going more into induced pluripotent um, stem cell derived neurons and then making use of the, the novel tools we have with massively parallel enhancer screens, um, CRISPR-Cas type methods where we can actually manipulate and maybe also causally manipulate epigenetic changes by DCAS9 for example on different enhancers. I think we have, a, we have a big phase of mapping ahead of us. And then I think with that better understanding, we can, we can be more mechanistically. And I agree with Adrian, like this, like understanding how the environment actually mediates these epigenetic changes and really looking at these, and it's, it's, it's probably like machineries of proteins that need to aggregate at specific sites and come together. And then why are some epigenetic changes transient and then some are lasting, and how are they reversible? I think that's going to be a bit the big challenge for the next years. Excellent uh, challenge, I think, uh, to undertake. So, do you expect that in ten years uh, this would be answered? <laughs> I don't know, but you I think there, the there, there are there are very important developments technologically that I think make it more likely that we will be there than uh, five years ago. <laughs> 
Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Anna, would you like to add any other point here? Uh, we cannot hear you. Ah. How about now? Yes. Yes. I think that I can only add my wishful thinking of what I would like to see happening in the next 10 years. And I think I would have kind of two wishes. And one would be that similarly to GWAS, you know, a long time ago, we saw that it started just with very small sample sizes. And then over the years, people were able to build consortia. And now we can see it also happening for the uh, psychiatric phenotypes and epigenetics that we start collecting samples, uh, you know, internationally across different groups. And only then we believe that we can gain enough statistical power to find uh, true signals that are associated between methylation and mental disorders. But that also comes with the fact that we also start realizing that we need to uh, synchronize our data perhaps in a better way. So not only to talk about the same phenotype, but also perhaps to process the data in the same way, uh, perform quality control of the data in the same way. So it, it starts to, to be a really big um, initiative of working together into analyzing and talking about exactly the same way of treating the data to get meaningful results out of it. And the second um, thing is something that Elizabeth also mentioned upon now, which is that when we measure DNA methylation signals, we actually measure really a lot of components that change the methylation. So we will measure the genetic effect, we will measure the environmental effect, tissue-specific effects, and also some stochastic effects that will impact the methylome. And I think it would be fantastic to see some uh, statistical models that would allow us to you know, incorporate all different types of data, not necessarily to to remove these, let's say, environmental effects as we do now, because right now we would, for example, adjust for smoking, while the smoking could contribute to development of the mental disorder. And so I think it would be fantastic to see development of these new statistical methods that would actually allow us for integration of uh, these different types of data. So yeah, you started, uh, thank you, Anna, answering a bit uh, how we can get there. And I think one is, uh, collaboration and uh, working together in consortia. And then the other one is development of tools for analysis, etc. So I think it goes indeed uh, in the same direction as uh, Elizabeth was saying. We need to understand better in order to know how we can uh, maybe uh, intervene or how what would be the next uh, important question. Mandy, would you like to add something to this uh, general yes, question? So Yes, so uh, first of all, Anna took my point away. It was the data harmonization and the collaborating together. This is really important in the human EWAS field. But something that I also miss in the, well, especially the EWAS field and, well, maybe a little bit on target gene or candidate genes for uh, DNA or DNA methylation is the integration between uh, human studies and animal studies. And here, animal studies, again, can tell us a lot about the mechanisms because we can look in the brain, we can compare, compare brain tissue with blood tissue and go back to humans. And we can control their behavior and their environment, something we cannot do for the humans, the human studies. So I think uh, there is a big gap still that we are not communicating the human people and the animal people, so to say. This, I think, brings us to a, another question that uh, you all mentioned uh, from different type of uh, perspectives. I think it's this uh, re uh, relationship with the genome. And uh, I was surprised uh, in Adrian's uh, talk uh, that he said that the mouse completely uh, reproduces or recapitulates uh, the human condition because uh, many times these mice are also inbred uh, strains that uh, are equal for all type of genes, etc. So uh, I was wondering to what extent uh, you think that uh, indeed combining the genome is the way to go now or taking more simple uh, tools like uh, inbred mice or uh, inbred lines. Uh, for example, I, I was wondering Elizabeth's lines uh, if they are inbred or if they are outbred for the different uh, cell lines that you were talking and the organoids, etc. So perhaps the question is, Indeed, for epigenetics to uh, 
to progress. What's your uh, uh, understanding? Should we really implement all this genetic variation and that's going to be important or not at all? Because we have the same uh, effects in a, a mouse that it's uh, totally inbred and so different also genetically uh, to, to humans. Who would like to, to start answering this question? Well, you invoke the, 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 the mouse. and I mean, obviously, the reason you use inbred mice is to try to minimize the number of variable, variables you're looking at. And many phenotypes, as you say, are different depending on um, the background of, of the mice. It just so happens, though, that with high penetrance uh, phenotypes, like, for example, the, the Rett syndrome phenotype in, in, uh, in males, uh, then... Um, the variability is, is, you know, you you need it whatever genetic background you've got. And if you don't have this gene, you die um, after a, a, a short period of time. So I think that, you know, the penetrance is high. Therefore, you can study it in, in even outbred uh, lines. Uh, there are differences. So uh, some inbred lines uh, develop um, phenotypes more quickly. They die earlier They die uh, as opposed to later. So, you know, there are differences, but those differences are small compared to the magnitude of the primary effect. Now, when you're dealing with uh, disorders where there's not necessarily high penetrance or where the, the magnitude of the effect is quite small, then that's when inbred lines become very important. And that's where natural human populations or outbred species like, say, rats, uh, usually, usually outbred, uh, you know, are more challenging. So you have to sort of match your model to the question you're asking, really. Uh, and that's, um, you know, I, I, my concern is really with looking at the epigenomic influences of the epigenome. These effects are quite often quite subtle. So it's something that I think would have to be coped with. That's my, my view. Mm -hmm. Any other yeah, I mean, answer to this question? Yeah, I mean, we, we've looked into it, like, I mean, it's clear that, that genetic variation influences epigenetic sites, like uh, tons of MQTLs that have been mapped. Uh, but also, like, we and others have shown that the environmental um, associations with the epigenome can be conditional on a certain genetic, even local genetic background. And I think this is important to take into account. I mean, as, as, as already said, we, we need even larger cores to really understand that because right now we have these small effects in EWAS that we see. And then if we think about moderation by genotype, you need even larger um, samples to really look at this um, in a lot of detail. Um, and I also think it, it, it depends on the effect sizes we're looking at and the types of tissues and the cell type specificity. Um, so, for example, we looked at the acute effects of glucocorticoids on DNA methylation in hundreds of individuals in peripheral blood. And so while we see consistent decreases in methylation in certain response elements, this can be moderated by SNPs, but then the differences are, are, are quite small. So you need to be very focused in what you look at. But integrating the two, I think, is important. And the same goes for, for what we're doing in the brain organoids. Now we're looking, we've been looking at three different cell lines, but of course they have different genetic background. They're male and female cell lines that may have very different um, like reactions or epigenetic changes. So we need to scale up our experiments also to get a better understanding there. And we have the possibility now with CRISPR-Cas to introduce the genetic variants to get a better understanding also. I think this is a big technological advantage uh, to better study this, this, this interaction of genotype and, and, and some other challenges, also big development, for example. Thank you. I think uh, indeed uh, we are insisting on the um, technical approach uh, and also on the difficulty and complexity of the system. Uh, Anna and uh, Mandy, would you like to add something? here no we can well, I, move to the next I add that one of the possible solutions would be also to start uh, for EWAS studies to stratify our cases based on their genetic background which would allow us to have a more clearer picture that is less clouded by the underlying genetic uh, background of an individual what are the methylation uh, differences also between cases and controls. But in order to 
be able to create these groups of cases, we would also need more individuals to participate in the study. And also perhaps we could start with something simpler, so to start with some very obvious um, and maybe easier to find uh, genetic effects like copy number variants, and for example, com um, compare people with a deletion and their metaloms to people without a deletion to get an overview of how their metaloms differ and how it can impact the differences in phenotype that are observed with and without deletion. Yes, I, I think as uh, you are all the proposing solutions or interest, etc. And I go back a little bit to the comments by Adrian that it might depend on the case. Uh, if it's a, a gene or if it's a disruption which is major, then perhaps that gives us better opportunities uh, to tackle that particular uh, target because it's a major disruption. It's not maybe more subtleties that's going to depend uh, on the cell type or the interaction or whatever, it's something that it's very dramatic somehow. And I was wondering if uh, this could be maybe the difference between those conditions, which are maybe more disease uh, or conditions that are life-threatening or very disturbing versus what we do indeed in uh, the field of uh, neurodevelopment, of uh, stress, trajectories, et cetera, in which uh, we have many factors like the gene, different environments, different uh, moderators, different uh, situations that all contribute a little bit. And then eventually we pre perhaps get a picture of changes that when we apply uh, like big data analysis, uh, we can understand that uh, what are the important moderators, etc. But eventually there are so many cases that we don't have a single model to tackle. And then if we are thinking about uh, how to use it, uh, it might be I don't know, and you are really the expert here with the yeah, polygenic risk, risk score, for example, that uh, could work as a kind of a biomarker uh, to understand the disease. But can we go beyond uh, understanding the mechanisms and maybe also discovering biomarkers to be able to use these findings also for treatment, as it's the case, for example, in RET uh, syndrome that I think the findings point at possible solutions which are very concrete, whereas in the, in the other cases it's more complex and less clear. No? Anybody would like to uh, discuss this point or? I mean, I, I yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just the more complex disorders, and as, as you said, I think there's a convergence of risk factors: genetic, environmental, aging, developmental. And I think understanding the points of convergence will be important. So what are what are the points where, where we have strong convergence of these factors and maybe then we can identify hub genes um, that could be important or we identify a certain threshold of changes that need to happen to come to disease. So that would be one take of it, but I think the other one are, are, there, are there more serious. So in this case, uh, yeah, Adrian, please go on. I'm sorry, Adrian. I would quite like to know, you know, the magnitude of the effect of the epigenome versus the effects of genetic background. <clears throat> you know, if if genetic background has a lot can have a large effect, and the epigenome is smaller than that, then that's going to be very difficult to detect. But if and I don't know, maybe there is evidence for this that the epigenetic effects is bigger than the effects of genetic background. Then, um, th then you know that that would be a more more hopeful. But I do, I mean, is there, for example, this is a slightly different point, but is there a model of um, an animal model of ADHD? My guess is not, but I, I don't honestly know. Animal model of ADHD, that's for uh, Mandy, I think. Hmm? Yeah, so I think there are animal models of hyperactivity and also attention. There are attention tasks, but of course it's what we think that they are doing, if they are really having the ADHD phenotype and thoughts, yes. I don't know, but they exhibit the behavior, the externalizing yeah. behavior, yes. It's sort of the same with autism. One has to, you know, uh, have multiple tests that convince you that there is something similar to what in humans would be called autism. Uh, and it's, uh, they vary in the degree of uh, convincingness. So it's a... Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, but having, a, I mean, obviously for, for a disorder, like a strong disorder, like the one I work on, that makes it a lot easier um, 
Whereas uh, your weak disorders, it's 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 or, you know ones where the the boundary between what is called normal and what is called diseased is is actually extremely fuzzy. That 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 makes it technically difficult to work on, unless you could find a mutation, you know, that always causes ADHD, and that might lead you into a pathway, and that pathway may lead you to other players, including genetic or epigenetic players. But without that, it's difficult to to get the breakthrough. Connected to this point, uh, we have one question from Prakash Devaraju that uh, is uh, uh, thinking that about developing therapeutic or other interventional strategies, as these genetic and epigenetic causes are being identified, what will be a good strategy? Intervening at the molecular level, more bottom-up, or at the circuit and behavioral level? Top down, indeed, because you can induce changes by changing behavior, for example. Anybody would like uh, to answer this? Perhaps uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question because there, there are drugs that can modify certain epigenetic enzymes, but, but then to really direct the, the, the changes to where you want them, you need the cell to do the things where you would have these directed effects. So maybe it's, it could be a combination of pharmacological interventions that could sort of maybe enhance um, the effects of certain behavioral or circuit activation targets. But yeah, this, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough question because yeah, I'm, I'm, I still think we're lacking some, somewhat the tools of these targeted um, epigenetic changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, this is one way to see it. Uh, I was also thinking there are many other general treatments eh, that uh, we know are good in general for stress-related disorders, like, for example, nutritional interventions or exercise uh, or um, maybe stress inoculation, etc. One could also imagine to look at the epigenetic changes uh, in pathways that uh, are affected by stress, for example, and then see what works or what doesn't work, etc. That's uh, perhaps something similar to this case. So one question of how we get there, eh? because I think uh, many of you have been asking for more data and bigger consortia, etc. So I was wond wondering from the beginning of the session, in fact, uh, because everything is so complex uh, and uh, indeed for the human uh, studies and advancement uh, when it's data, what would be the percentage of uh, work that you think uh, needs to be done in, in the individual labs from now on to the future, or whether we need a big consortia for everything, not only for the human data, but perhaps to be able to tackle the complexity in any of the model organisms as well, taking into account all the different aspects, uh, including the, the, the time, related questions and many other uh, different moder moderators and moderators of uh, these uh, pathways. Uh, how do you think we should move the, the field forward to the future? The way we're doing at the moment, a bit uh, uh, bottom-up approach uh, from individual labs, uh, I, I mean more for the, for the basic uh, uh, labs. Uh, that would be more for Adrian, I think, and uh, Elizabeth again. What you're thinking? If you, uh, yeah. I was muted despite the fact that I was uh, talking. Though, um, yeah, I think it's difficult to be predictive about this. Um, you know, it's obviously, this the human genome couldn't have been sequenced um, by an accumulation of small labs adding their gene of interest to a big pot. It had to be done in a mechanized way. You could say the same with connectomics. Uh, you know, it has to be a large-scale operation with a dedicated team of people working on it. Those, the, um, and indeed, structural biology now is quite often done by teams of, teams of people churning through large numbers of structures. But in my opinion, uh, and you, you may say this is uh, an old-fashioned, uh, is there is no substitute for the uh, single obsessed uh, scientist exploring all the possibilities to interpret that data. Because what you end up with, with the high throughput studies, is a mound of data. Anybody who's done mass spec, you know, you get a list. Uh, and the list, despite one's hopes, 
doesn't tell you anything until you've asked questions based on the list. And, and I think um, huge numbers of epigenomes would give you vast lists. What we need is ways, and I think actually um, Leandros was, was alluding to this, ways in which you can use mathematics to, to delve into those. But I actually think individual, I still think the unit of, of creative science is still the individual. And I think there are still plenty of uh, uh, examples of that. Individuals or the small dedicated team as opposed to the large um, consortium. But uh, people may, you know, in 10 years time, they're, they're, when it's all consortia, I may have been proved completely wrong. And, and artificial intelligence has replaced the small individual scientists. Uh, I may regret my uh, prediction. No, I think uh, this is a very important uh, uh, point in our advancement towards the future, how we organize science. And uh, I think your point is very valid and it's proved uh, important until now. But I would like to hear perhaps uh, also Elizabeth uh, answer and if uh, Anna or Mandy want to add something yeah, I mean, as well, of course. I mean, I, I, I think we need both. So I, I, need, we, I think we need consortia that have similar standards um, across large samples or methods, even animal models, and the necessity to share this data. But I also uh, absolutely agree that, that we need this curiosity, sort of individual driven science that then can also leverage um, the, the, the very solid data from these large consortiums. So I think we need, we need both. Uh, Fantastic. Um, any other comment here? We have, uh, I think, a very interesting follow up here. Uh, it's uh, Isabel Mansui is uh, saying, uh, this concerns Adrian's interrogation on the magnitude of genetic versus epigenetic effects and the fact that up to now epigenetic effects seem to be minor compared to genetic effects. It could be because epigenetic effects are looked at separately and not together. Could that be the reason? I think uh, Elizabeth agrees. How about uh, Adrian? Oh, Would you like me to? Uh, you could you could ask others. I mean, I think it's possible. Um, you know, anything is possible, and entrenched views uh, are uh, always temporary, as they get knocked over by new discoveries. So, I it could be that one needs to look at the two together. But I mean, you no. Know, to me, it's always been strange that identical twins are the sort of symbol of epige epigenetics, or they were. Uh, you know, because because identical twins are an illustration of the fact that genetics is incredibly important, um, uh, and they are used as a sort of control to study uh, convergence or non-convergence. So, you know, you, you could argue that inbred lines or identical twins are a tremendous substrate for distinguishing the effects of genetics from epigenetics. And to me, the effects of genetics seem very often much larger than the effects of epigenetics. But I'm really happy to be proven wrong should the data, maybe there's data already that proves me wrong, I don't know. Um, perhaps, yeah, Elis uh, say. Isabel Mansui, she comments afterwards that uh, she thinks that uh, if all the epigenetic uh, markers, all the epigenetic mechanisms, uh, DNA methylation, histone, uh, PTMs, uh, uh, non-coding RNAs, if they would be all taken together, it, perhaps <clears throat> they have a bigger weight than what we think at the moment when we look at one at a time. But this is I mean, something indeed uh, to do eh? now with the new tools eh, to analyze all this, eh? Elizabeth. Yeah, no, I just want, I think like if you look at complex disorders, like we have like many, many variants of small effect that when aggregated in some diseases actually explain quite substantial levels of variance, like for schizophrenia, for depression, it's 2%. And, but we do know that adversity and stress, for example, explains much more of the variance. But I think we still have not really mapped these environmental risk factors to their potentially epigenetic correlates or circuit level correlates or a mixture um, of everything together. So I, I think a, a, a better mapping of like what, 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 what actually conveys the risk also of these environmental factors that at least for some disorders are, are really the, the stronger risk factors. I think we need that. And, and there, I, I would agree with Isabel that, that we, we, we're not there yet. We're mapping 
one level back and often also not in the right tissue. Don't you think that uh, perhaps one element that we are missing here is a better um, behavioral or phenotypic characterization? Because we try to explain something that it's also very complex and uh, where there is a lot of variation in symptoms, but also in expression of uh, characteristics, etc. Maybe a better segregation of uh, individuals uh, or responses. Like we are talking about autism, ADHD, but of course when we move to another field like circuit neuroscience, normally is trying to explain a single type of behavior. And this is, uh, I think, perhaps one way to go to not only explain individuals, but explain uh, specific behavioral differences. Uh, this is uh, something that you are trying as well with your analysis and your different uh, approaches in animal, in humans, for example, or, or you look at the... I mean, I think we, we do right now, all our genes come from cross-sectional um, evaluations of a disease state at a certain time point. Often, sometimes you have samples that have been followed over several years. I think that's what we need. We, we really need sort of like birth cohorts where we can actually follow trajectories with a mapping of environmental factors and genetic factors and, and, and other factors mm -hmm. to really go on. And then, of course, it would be great to measure changes in circuit levels, epigenetic changes in specific cells and circuits over time um, or understand what are good model systems for that. Excellent. Uh, yeah. I think that I, I think we one comment, uh, if I may regarding the effects of genetics versus epigenetics, uh, which is that, well, perhaps the effects of epigenome at the time where we measure them, they seem to be small, but they actually might have had a much bigger effect at certain developmental point at which we were not able to, to measure it. And that's why what Elizabeth also mentioned now, that also collection of this longitudinal data with multiple sampling points it is very important for our understanding because we know that sometimes what we saw to be, let's say, differentially methylated at very early time point, it is no longer differentially methylated and associated with the phenotype of interest. But it can also mean that it was only important in that very specific window where this um, neuronal development or synapse formation was uh, was happening in the in the brain. So we should also perhaps not completely give up the hope for the effect of the methylome, but think about are we measuring at exactly the most um, appropriate time that that was for, for these um, phenotypical changes. So, I mean, that's a hypothesis. And uh, like all hypotheses, it's only really useful if you can test it. So, um, you know, to, to test that hypothesis, you know, if, if, if the gene is only required for... Um, three weeks during development in the in in uh, the CA1 region of the hippocampus, then, uh, you know, that's that's not going to be easy to find. So, you know, if, if you, you really you really want to um, think of whether or not that hypothesis is, is easy to test. Uh, in other words, do you have a, a clue as to where you should look when? Because I think without that, that would be it would condemn you to a very long fishing expedition that may or may not be successful. <clears throat> Yeah, very good. Um, there is a question here that uh, is from Emma, and she's asking, how are genetics and epigenetics helping better understand the circuits of the nervous system and how it will be affecting the neuroscience field in the coming years? <coughs> Anybody would like to answer this vision? How maybe to bring together epigenetics, genetics, and circuit uh, neuroscience, uh, a more general neuroscience uh, uh, brain and behavior. Well, we're still in the stage where, you know, people are using optogenetics to map circuits and the importance of individual components of circuits, which is basically the light induced annihilation of certain neurons, you know. So comparing that to the effects of uh, DNA methylation, which may be of smaller magnitude, you know, given that we haven't yet worked out how circuits are contributing to various higher functions of the brain anywhere, or just at the beginning of that. It's, it's, then I, it, it feels to me as though uh, looking at the effects of epigenetics would be a stage after that. Um, 
maybe if if you're right uh, and and actually you add together every single epigenetic uh, variable and then you start to see big effects then maybe that would change mm -hmm. but um it, it feels to me as though that's a that's a pretty tall order at the moment but 10 years is a long time if we're still on the 10 year <clears throat> yeah, yeah I I think, mean, uh, please uh, elizabeth no i was just saying that i think we're, we're 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 getting there where we can map circuit activity also on sort of single cell population level um and that could then allow by sorting these cells or enriching these cells to actually see whether um, any kind of, uh, yeah, there are epigenetic changes um, that are seen with learning and whatever um, could actually alter the circuit activity uh, and that maybe you get conjoint epigenetic effects uh, across different stages in the circuit. So basically going the way that Adrian said, defining the circuit and then understanding what epigenetics also plays a role in relaying and altering um, circuit interactions. But we could also argue that for some of the circuits, uh, we have a good understanding already. So I think, uh, yeah, the question is more whether or not uh, it makes sense to already start implementing uh, epigenetic uh, analysis, epigenetic manipulations to see how they contribute to the functioning of the circuit or how the circuit affects uh, epigenetic uh, modifications, for example. It's something you think... Uh, would be useful for the advancement of uh, neuroscience or do you think uh, just genetic studies, or, I mean more genetic manipulations without thinking so much on the epigenome would bring us to the same type of uh, conclusions? It's a bit provocative question for the epigenetic uh, panel. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, yeah. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I, I was, I wasn't going to say anything. Okay. No, I mean, I, I was just going to say. I mean, I, I do believe that epigenetics is very important in regulating uh, cell function and also the the responsivity of cells. And I, I think, I mean, there are many researchers out there already who are combining circuit uh, level investigations with uh, changes or looking at epigenetic markers, um, for example, to combine that. And I think if we we have an understanding that also genetic variants associated with psychiatric disease risk are enriched for those that actually influence um, genes that are important for regulating the epigenome. So I think there, there is this convergence where we need to better understand sort of the causal chain from the gene to the epigenome, to the circuit, to the behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very good roadmap uh, to have. Uh, Mandy, uh, Anna, anything to add? I would like uh, perhaps to think uh, of how to use uh, this knowledge uh, that you are developing and um, we've been discussing the complexity indeed the uh, brain and cell specific changes uh, and uh, some groups are trying to develop uh, tools to be able to target some epigenetic modifications in a cell-specific manner somehow. It's challenging, but I think uh, it might be the way to go for some of the findings that uh, you might be coming up in some of the different fields that you are investigating. Uh, if, because we are thinking ahead, uh, where would we like to be in 10 years? Do you think this is something uh, feasible, something that you would say, okay, if somebody asked me from a funding agency, if uh, I would agree that a uh, project uh, with those goals uh, is uh, supported, uh, what's your thinking? Do you think it's something feasible or do you just have a proposal of what should be done perhaps before doing something like that? Well, I think we're already able to, um, to like edit the genome in a methylation manner, so to CRISPR-Cas DNA methylation in specific regions in cell cultures. So, and this maybe also comes a little bit to the question, do we need a consortia or single creative scientists? I think this is a really nice opportunity to use these cell models and these techniques to test what results the big consortia come with, put their efforts with, and then test with these technologies in cell type specific ways, what is actually happening if we manipulate this. 
and there have the creative single scientists going, uh, you know, fi finding these answers. I think there also these two sides need each other. I mean, there's a classic example yeah. of a, <clears throat> a, a DNA methylation change, which is uh, <clears throat> leads to a human disorder, and that's fragile X syndrome. You know, the expansion of the trinucleotide repeat uh, does not by itself silence the, uh, the uh, fragile X gene. It's the methylation that follows it. And the Anish lab has shown in, in the way that uh, Mandy alluded to, you know, you can target CRISPR-Cas and, and demethylate that and, you know, potentially reactivate the gene. There are problems with doing that in uh, an animal as opposed to in a cultured cell line. Uh, <clears throat> but if those could be overcome, and another problem that would need to be overcome is delivery. Uh, we don't have vectors that deliver to most neurons in the brain. Um, they only seem to deliver at the moment to a very small fraction. If both of those could be solved, then engineering, you know, proper editing of um, of the genome, including of the epigenome, would be something I think that uh, it would be realistic. And it's it seems to me that the, the urge to get vectors that go to a large fraction of cells in the brain or indeed in other tissues, um, you know, those, it's particularly the brain, um, that should be soluble, you would imagine. And, and there are mouse vectors that will do that, AAV vectors that go to most neurons. That tells you that it's possible to have a high uh, infectivity of these uh, vectors. So if people come up with that and can get these CRISPR um, uh, editases to demethylate regions efficiently, then I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be used therapeutically for cases where there's a clear connection between the methylation, either too much or too little, and uh, and the phenotype, or clinical manifestation, I should say. Thank you, Adrian. Anybody would like to add something here? So I think, uh, indeed, uh, you're proposing, again, uh, if the phenotype is uh, very clearly uh, linked to, to the man manipulation, to the modification, and it's a very clear case, I could imagine also that perhaps uh, when we understand better the complexity with all the elements that have been discussed, uh, eventually one could also tackle something more subtle with similar type of tools uh, somehow because uh, ideally one could measure uh, the, the markers and then tackle the markers in, in similar ways. And the, the, uh, I think the challenge uh, that goes beyond what it's been done until now, it's uh, more the, the cell specificity but that's, uh, I guess, uh, on the way coming. So I, I think uh, we have a couple of other questions, but they uh, reinforce uh, the discussion that we've already had. I, I think uh, we covered uh, many different aspects. Uh, and uh, before we close, I would like to ask if uh, any of you would like to give uh, any further comments uh, or uh, maybe to post uh, indeed uh, what's your challenge for yourself, for your own uh, science, not only for the field, but uh, what would you like to uh, maybe solve uh, in the next uh, five to ten years, or if there is anything else that you would like to, to say before we close this discussion. Please feel free. Don't feel uh, forced to say anything else. I think we already covered many, but it might be that we still have uh, a few important points uh, to, to indicate. Uh, I think we are cautious here, perhaps uh, we can uh, continue in the future. There were many other, I think, uh, more specific questions that uh, would have been also interesting to tackle uh, coming from each of your talks, but it's uh, more difficult for a general discussion. I think uh, we went for the bigger picture. And I would like uh, to thank you very much for very inspiring presentations, for amazing work uh, that you are doing, I think, advancing this uh, very complex field in ways that are promising for the future. And then I would like to thank also uh, uh, the, the attendees, and there were excellent questions, and there was participation also voting for the questions, etc. So I think that made it also very dynamic. Uh, and uh, I would uh, like to apologize on the name of the organizers for this technical problem that we had. I think it would be fantastic to hear Jonathan uh, Mill in the future about his wonderful work as well. And perhaps uh, we can think uh, in the future to have another session for a follow-up and then see where we 
stand a few years after this discussion and, and what's next. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. I would like to uh, rem remind everyone that uh, the Brain Price uh, Conference continues tomorrow and every day this week until Thursday at 3 p.m. and that there will be uh, very interesting uh, presentations tomorrow. The topic is going to be genomics, genetics uh, and identification of mutations. And uh, it's going to uh, include presentations by Matthew Hurls, Mark Daly and uh, Joseph Bauschbaum as uh, the plenary speakers. And, and um, that's all for now. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.